information. Representatives from the FBI, the Justice and Defense Departments, and the media testified during this 5-hour and 15-minute hearing. James Madison said it most eloquently when he wrote, A popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern in ignorance, said Madison, and a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. It was in this spirit that three decades ago, Congress passed the Freedom of Information Act, or as it's commonly referred to, the FOIA Act. As the 1966 committee report which accompanied the act stated the Freedom of Information Act would provide a, quote, true federal public record statute by requiring the availability to any member of the public of all the executive branch records described in its requirements, unquote. It is noteworthy that the first report issued by the House Committee on Government Reform and Oversight in this Congress is a citizen's guide on using the Freedom of Information Act and the Privacy Act of 1974 to request government records. In the years since its enactment, the types of information and the format in which they are maintained have advanced tremendously. The number of requests which the departments and agencies receive exceeds 600,000 each year. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has a backlog of four years on its responses to FOIA requests. I should know. I was informed of that fact when I sent a letter, knowing that this hearing would eventually be coming, seeking information under the Act. We hope to learn from our witnesses this morning how the Freedom of Information Act has fulfilled its mandate and their suggestions for improving its implementation. The subcommittee will hear from Rosalind Mazur, the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Policy Development, Department of Justice. The Justice Department has general oversight responsibility of the Freedom of Information Act. We will next hear from representatives of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Defense, and as many of you are undoubtedly aware of the actions of the FBI, have come under fire when it was revealed that highly confidential records have been misused by the White House. These records pertain to former White House staff members from Reagan and Bush administrations, some of whom have been working on Capitol Hill. The records were requested in the name of a high White House official. The FBI seemed to have no problem immediately providing 339 files about which we now know, and there are probably others. These records were to be reviewed by the employees of the Clinton administration seeking derogatory information on the former White House employees. This is a most serious matter. It will be handled by the full committee next week. The Privacy Act was enacted to prevent this unwarranted intrusion in the privacy of Americans using information maintained by the federal government. In brief, the Privacy Act is designed to prevent Big Brother, whether president, presidential aide, members of Congress, or a career civil servant, from looking into possible confidential information unless there's a legitimate need to know. Dirty politics is not a legitimate need to know. The Office of Management and Budget will be brought before this subcommittee to discuss its oversight of the Privacy Act in the next few years, a uh, few days. The subcommittee will also receive testimony this morning from representatives of groups which frequently make requests under the Freedom of Information Act. Our last panels will consist of officials from the General Services Administration, public interest groups, private attorneys commenting on the effectiveness and implementation of the government in the Sunshine Act and the Federal Advisory Committee Act. As with the Freedom of Information Act, the Sunshine Act affords Americans first-hand access to the decision-making process of the federal government. The Federal Advisory Committee Act requires the General Services Administration to review the number of advisory committees in use and to determine whether they are fulfilling their intended purpose. Uh, we now have, uh, I will ask the gentleman who represents the minority, Mr. Peterson, gentleman from Minnesota, if you have an opening statement, if you don't, we will move to Senator Leahy. I know he's pressed on time, but if you do, we'd certainly well, be Mr. glad Chairman, to have Well, Mr. Chairman, I do have a short statement. If that's Sure, right. please go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, for holding this hearing today regarding uh, laws governing public access to information. And uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank Senator Leahy for coming to testify about his bill, uh, the Electronic Freedom of Information Act of 96. Uh, one of the biggest frustrations with the uh, Freedom of Information Act, as we know it, is that uh, deadlines are rarely met. And I commend Senator Leahy for working to uh, 
alleviate this problem and especially want to hear about the provision in this bill that will give public online access to the Federal Register and records available to the public. And I look forward to the consideration of this bill in tomorrow's hearing. Today uh, we will hear testimony on how effectively government agencies and the departments administer the Freedom of Information Act, the Privacy Act, the Government Sunshine Act, and the Federal Advisory Committee Act, all vital public laws that give access to information while protecting the privacy of individual citizens. Uh, this is what democracy is all about. But I ask that uh, we focus our attention on the uh, one part of this, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which was passed in 1972 to control apparently the proliferation of advisory committees and make them accountable for their existence. And maybe uh, we need to strengthen uh, the accountability provision because I'm concerned about the vast number of advisory committees that are in existence today. Uh, like a lot of members of Congress, I'm very much interested in reducing paperwork, uh, reducing the deficit, streamlining government to make it as lean and efficient as possible for the American taxpayers. And uh, I just like, you know, I think we need to find out why taxpayers uh, have been burdened with paying $133 million for advisory committees in 1994, and why is it that the cost of advisory committees uh, currently is estimated to be about $160 million? Uh, I found the uh, 1987 GAO report on advisory committees to be uh, mind-boggling. Uh, why did we have to have 992 committees with 19,837 people serving on them? I noticed that 367 of these committees were created by agency heads. Why should we uh, require these agency heads to make, uh, we should require these agency heads to make an airtight case to justify the need of these advisory committees before the taxpayers uh, have to pay for setting up one more of these committees. I think the number of advisory committees uh, apparently uh, keep growing. Uh, uh, in 1993, we still had uh, 1,236 of them. So I was glad to see that uh, President Clinton signed an executive order to elimin eliminate at least 33 percent of these advisory committees not required by Congress. Uh, this dropped the number of those committees to 1,088, but I still think that that's too many. Uh, and we should make it uh, uh, difficult for an advisory committee to exist more than two years as the current law allows. Um, I question why we need, uh, why they need to exist that long. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, they, I think, should be able to get the job done and move on. So I think we owe it to the American people to uh, justify the need for all of these committees. I hope that we will focus on this because it's a, um, a big price tag. And uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and look forward to the testimony. I thank you. There will be a brief statement by the ranking minority member. Then we will get to Senator Leahy. And then we'll come back to the ranking minority member and to Mr. Tate of Washington after you get a chance to leave for your markup. Good morning, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding these two days of hearings. Information policy is what democracy is all about. Public access to government information, public participation and decision making, and public accountability for government officials. These all come about through our information policy. I welcome Senator Laid to this hearing. You have a well-deserved reputation for public service through protecting the rights of the public. You are to be congratulated for the leadership and perseverance you have shown on the Electronic Freedom of Information Improvement Act. I understand that a number of changes in the bill have been made to address the concerns of the administration. I would like to see that version introduced in the House of Representatives, and I look forward to working with the chairman to see that uh, that, that, that happens. I have a great deal more to say, but I just uh, right now would like to welcome you and, and hear what you have to say. And, and indicate my strong support for your bill and my willingness to work in the House to help pass it. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Senator Leahy, we're delighted to have you here. You've been a longtime architect of caring about the public and the average citizen's access to information. So please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I um, appreciate the fact that you and, and the subcommittee are taking such an active interest. And I was very pleased to hear your statement, uh, Mrs. Uh, Maloney's statement, Mr. Peterson's statement uh, here this morning. You know, this is, um, this is not a partisan issue. This is a good government issue. It's something that uh, when, we, when we try, as I think the American people want us to do, to find areas where Republicans and Democrats can come together, this is one we should. We're talking about maintaining access to 
federal agency records and, and the access should be the same whether they're on a piece of paper or on a computer hard drive. Uh, the Freedom of Information Act is one of the most significant tools that we have to know what our government is about and in the 22 years I've been here in the Senate it seems that this is something that I've I've worked on virtually every year to try to find ways to improve it. Look what we've gotten out of it. In the past few months, uh, records released under FOIA have revealed FAA actions against ValueJet before the May 11th crash in the Everglades, revealed the government's treatment of South Vietnamese commandos who fought in a CIA-sponsored army in the early 1960s, uh, they revealed the high salaries paid to independent councils, revealed the unsafe lead content of D.C. tap water, and revealed the types of tax cases that the IRS recommends for a criminal prosecution. What we've also seen in 30 years since uh, FOIA became law, the technology has dramatically changed how we handle information. When I go home on weekends, as I will this weekend to my a farmhouse in Middlesex, Vermont, I no longer carry a big briefcase with me. I've got a little laptop up there and I'll sit, uh, uh, I'll sit in the living room and I'll tap out if I need a file from my office, I'll just pull it up on, on my laptop. But that's the way we keep records. But unfortunately, as one analyst said, federal agencies remain divided and confused about how they should respond to FOIA requests seeking electronic records. And one federal information officer said, a lot depends upon what Congress does. We're not going to take the lead when Congress hasn't acted yet. We wouldn't want to. Uh, we want guidance and we want to be consistent. Well, let's give them that guidance. Uh, and we can set that consistency. There isn't a single government agency that doesn't use electronic uh, filing. So let's update the FOIA to address those issues. We need to make clear that the FOIA is not just a right to know what's on paper records, but it applies equally to what's on electronic records. On the Senate, Senators Brown, Kerry, and I have sponsored legislation to amend the FOIA so that agencies use technology to make government more accessible. The, uh, we recognize the importance of access here in the, here in the Congress when we pass the GPO access law requiring online access to important government uh, public publications. The Federal Register, or, uh, the House initiated the Thomas system for online access to legislation. And certainly I find in my own web page that people, uh, people make use of that a, a great deal. But I'd like to highlight some of what the bill would accomplish. First, it would require agencies to provide records in a requested format whenever possible. Now, this runs counter to the view of most agencies who think that they should determine what format it should come out with, not what the requester asks. Uh, the bill would address the biggest single complaint of people making FOIA requests, delays in getting a response. For some agencies, those delays can stretch to two years. Well, depending on what you're asking for, a delay of that nature might mean no access at all. Uh, because the information you seek, if you have to wait a year, have to wait two years, it can well be useless by the time you get it. And such routine failure to comply with the statutory time limits is bad for morale in the agencies, and it breeds contempt by citizens who expect government officials to abide by, not routinely break the law. Now, Speaker Gingrich, um, and I, who do agree on some things on occasion, I, I must say, Mr. Chairman, uh, usually to his surprise, uh, but to our joint uh, pleasure, he strongly indicated his support for the goals of this legislation in April. He said, my position will be that I favor any set of records which would be, in fact, available if they were in print, being available if they were electronic, because they are, are for all practical purposes, the same record. My bias is absolutely in favor of the notion electronic information is the same as printed information, and therefore you ought to have the same rights. I agree with the Speaker, and as I said, this is not a partisan issue. It's a good government issue. It should make no difference whether we have a, a Democrat administration or Republican administration. Let's do it. Uh, in closing, let me say this. 
One commentator has said that these amendments to the FOIA have become as much an annual Washington tradition as a cherry blossom festival. Well, I enjoy the cherry blossom festival. I enjoy tradition. But this is a tradition that should stop. We shouldn't have to keep trying to upgrade FOIA. Let's do it once and for all. We're in the electronic age. Uh, let's reflect the fact that the governments and the access to our, the citizens of this government are also available in the electronic age. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we appreciate your comments. We agree with you completely. You can be sure that every agency witness that we have before us, we will be pursuing implementation. Did they ask for the resources? Who turned them down? Was it the cabinet officer? Was it OMB? Was it the president? Was it the Congress? And uh, I think it's unconscionable when I hear that the FBI has a four-year wait. And it makes no sense to me. And it's uh, another way to just duck implementation of the law. So we will be pursuing that. Let me ask you what you think the greatest barrier is that you see to citizen access to governmental records. What do you regard with, based on your experience, as the greatest barrier? Just knowing how to do it and do it easily, uh, you know, it, a lot depends upon the agency. And we have some agencies that are very, very good at responding, and others that can uh, balance the angels on the head of a pin when they look at what you want. If um, if you want to go through a bureaucratic tangle, they can stop you because they're going to say the average citizen, well, you didn't ask specifically for this, or you didn't do That's not the way it should be. If agencies really want people to know what they're doing, which means that they're going to know about mistakes as well as the things they do right. If you do something right, they're going to send a press release out. They don't want you to know about the mistakes. Uh, then it can be done very easily. And electronically is probably going to be the best way. We have a whole new generation coming along uh, who, who know how to use computers, know how to use the search methods of them, and they should be allowed to. You talk about delays. If you were the cabinet official that ran that agency, and you say, look, we got this real big political issue coming up. Darn it, I want by 2 o'clock this afternoon, I want all the information on such and so. You know you're going to have it. Well. If it could be done that quickly for you as a, as a cabinet member, why can't uh, probably a much simpler request for Mr. Horn's citizen be answered just as quickly? You're absolutely correct. And that's what our aim ought to be in your legislation, our legislation, and whatever we finally figure out between the two bodies. Uh, would the ranking minority member have a question or two she'd like to ask before the senator yes. leaves? Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator. You mentioned in your, your testimony that delayed uh, access to information is almost the same as not having any access at all. And I'd like to ask you, would you support uh, requiring agencies to include in their annual reports st statistics on the number of requests completed, the, the medium time to complete them, the, the total number of pending requests, and the and, and uh, so that we could keep track of how many requests are out there and whether they're being met or not? Would you support such I, tracking? I would. I would. And in fact, if they're doing it electronically, it's going to be that much easier. It's, it's going to be really easy to do that. And frankly, I mean, I serve on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, a number of the different agencies come before the various subcommittees I'm on. If I was an agency head, I'd like to come in and say, look, we got this number of requests. And we were this slow answering because we don't have the resources. Will you help us? And I have a feeling that the vast majority of members on our uh, committees and subcommittees in both parties would say, sure, we'll help you on that. Because one, we're not talking about that much money to begin with, uh, but it's the easiest way to do it. But the other thing, that you know what you're going to find? You're going to find that with the same resources, some departments answer these questions much, much faster than others. And it's usually the mindset of the department itself whether they want the answers mm -hmm. made. And that, that I found in both Republican and Democratic administrations. When you speak to the agencies, their response sometimes, and you'll ask them, why is that backlog? Why can't you process it? They say, we don't have the resources. That's their response right now. They'll say, we just don't have the resources. And, it, and we have other more important things to do, and we just cannot handle it. And, and uh, 
What kind of increase in personnel and, and budget um, would you think is needed to keep up with the current rate of, of requests? And, and in the absence of further resources, what, what would you recommend to improve the processing of, of, of FOIA requests? Well, it would depend upon the particular. It would depend upon the particular agency. You may have, uh, uh, you may well have a, an agency that has, for example, an agency that has class handles a lot of classified material. The CIA, the FBI, the Department of Defense. They are going to require uh, more time to make sure that they're also not just passing out uh, governmental secrets. You might have something like the Department of Agriculture, uh, where you're basically able to pull up something uh, very, very easily. Um, I have, um, in this bill, we have a lot of things, multi-track processing, uh, record management techniques, and a number of other things that will help make it a lot easier for them. But I, I would contend that all of this will be much faster if they go into the electronic era and they don't have somebody going down there trying to physically pull out huge stacks of paper. Some people um, are concerned about uh, your definition of record in your bill, and some of, of the critics of the bill say that this definition would actually block access to some government databases, and how would you answer that criticism? Well, I, it is certainly not the intent, and uh, we have worked, uh, Senator Brown, Senator Kerry, and I have worked very hard on this, and if somebody's got a better definition, certainly I'll, I'll be happy to work with them on that. We want we wanted to make it, uh, we, we want to design it always to err on the side of more access than less access. And if uh, somebody's got a better definition, mm -hmm. I'll be happy to applaud it and join it. Very well. Now I'll we'll yield to Mr. Tate, gentleman from Washington, for a question or two, and then we'll go to Mr. Peterson for a question or two, and you're home free. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to commend the Senator for his efforts in the Internet Caucus and, and on this particular legislation. Uh, one of the things, at least from my perspective, to make government more accountable is to make it more accessible, and I think you've taken a lead on that and should be commended. The, the complaint, though, continually is just the long delays, I and mean, it's great that it's accessible, but if it takes me a year to get it, I mean, what specifically in your bill will address that to help the average citizen that lives out in the Ninth District of Washington? If they want to get information on the Department of Education, for example, um, and they've got a computer at home. What, how will this affect their lives and how will they get the information more quickly? Um, it doubles the time to 20 days for an initial determination. But then it, that helps the agencies. But in sort of the quid pro quo is it encourages agencies to put a lot more of this information online. Uh, it does have a lot of ways to track multiple uh, requests. They claim this would delays them. Uh, they'll be able to track the multiple requests, answer them all at the same time, and uh, it does it in a way, too, in looking at just where the costs are going to go uh, to make the costs. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to realistic. Uh, right now, a lot of them will refuse, saying the costs are too much, and they, they delay for that. We have some pretty strict time limits in here, and we have the ability to, to pay for what is being uh, requested so that they will move further. The, the full uh, impetus of it is to put the pressure on the agencies to, to respond, but if, the, if it is electronic, it is going to be done much faster. I mean, you know, Mr. Tate, you're, you're one who uh, it, it seems almost a condescending term, but computer literate. And, and you know, a lot of us went kicking and screaming from the quill pen age, but I, I find when I pick up my computer, if I want to pick up something, I can use various search uh, uh, engines and, and go through very, very quickly, uh, very quickly on it, including my own email. And I know that the same thing would have taken me a day in the past, and I wouldn't have done it. Now I do it in two, three seconds. Uh, why not? Uh, why not require that here? If we have electronic, there will really be no excuse for delay, and, the, and then the Congress can require it. What we're saying about having a, a report each year from these agencies, how many FOIA requests did you get? How long did it take? That, in the long run, that will do more 
to make this work than anything else. Because if you have agencies, and there will be those that will comply very, very quickly, and when you have, like, on the federal page of the Post or whatever, uh, a comparison of who complied and who didn't, you know it's going to bring the pressure. Okay. Thank you. I Thank yield you. back my time. From uh, Minnesota, one, Mr. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Let me just ask one final question, Certainly. and that is, uh, how much emphasis or priority should we give members of the media who are working on stories that would be in the public interest and can't be held up for one year, two years, whatever, and does your bill address that problem? Well, there should be priority. Actually, everybody should have a priority, and um, I don't know exactly how to answer that question, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I would hope that uh, a priority is given to anybody who asks, because really the delays, in most instances, delays made are not real. I mean, they're, they're, they, well, the delay is real, but the reasons are not real for it. I would hope that the media has very good access because uh, I found in my 22 years here many times issues that come to my attention in whatever oversight committee I'm on came via the media, not via uh, my work or, any, or anybody, um, anybody uh, else's uh, of work. But we, there are certain compelling circumstances and the legislation will give expedited procedures for that. But I think that we have to, under, we have to acknowledge the fact in the Congress many, many times problems that we have gotten legitimately involved in came to our attention first through the media, not through constituents, not through our own work. I agree with you and uh, we will see if we can't do something about that on a joint basis. So thank, thank you. you very much for coming over thank and you. sharing your thoughts with us. It was a privilege to be here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will now go to the first or the second panel. We have Ms. Uh, Rosalyn A. Mazur, the Deputy Assistant Attorney General, Office of Policy Development, uh, Department of Justice. And uh, I might say, Ms. Mazur, we have a tradition on all subcommittees of government operations, government reform and oversight. So raise your right hand. Do you pledge in the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? We'll note that the witness has affirmed, and we will note that when questions are asked and we ask for a follow-up in writing, the oath still applies to you and all other witnesses. So please proceed. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, good morning. I'm pleased to be here to address the Department of Justice's role in administering the Freedom of Information Act, the principal statute governing public access to federal government records and information. This statute, which has now been in effect for nearly 30 years, has become an essential part of our democratic system of government, a vital tool for learning about the government's operations and activities. As you know, under the FOIA, the Department of Justice encourages agency compliance with the Freedom of Information Act, and this responsibility is discharged on a day-to-day -day basis by the Department's Office of Information and Privacy. Within the Department of Justice, each component bears the responsibility of responding in the first instance to FOIA requests for its own records. The Office of Policy Development provides policy guidance to the Attorney General on ways to improve the Department's performance of its responsibilities, including measures to enhance accountability of those who process FOIA requests, improve timeliness, and fundamentally to get more information out to the public. During the past three years, under the leadership of President Clinton and Attorney General Reno, the Department of Justice has taken steps to reinvigorate FOIA throughout the executive branch. In October 1993, President Clinton and Attorney General Reno issued statements of new FOIA policy to the heads of all federal departments and agencies. President Clinton called upon agencies to take a fresh look at their administration of the act in accordance with the new standards for FOIA administration set forth in the accompanying memorandum from Attorney General Reno. In turn, Attorney General Reno's FOIA memorandum established higher standards of government openness under the FOIA that apply both in FOIA litigation and at the administrative level. The essential elements of this FOIA policy are, one, an overall presumption of disclosure that is applied to decisions made on the use of FOIA exemptions, Two, a specific foreseeable harm standard governing the department's decision on whether to defend an agency's use of a FOIA exemption in court. 
and three, an accompanying emphasis on making discretionary disclosures of exempt records or information whenever possible under the Act. The Attorney General at the same time ordered a review on the merits of all FOIA litigation cases as measured against these disclosure standards. This has led to the disclosure of much additional information under the Act. The Department of Justice has taken specific steps to energize FOIA in accordance with these policies. For example, the Department has taken the lead among federal agencies in establishing a new mechanism for affording expedited access under the FOIA to the Department's records. In 1994, it expanded its expedited access policy to include requests in which there is widespread media interest in the records and which involve possible questions about the government's integrity which affect public confidence. Under this policy, which is implemented through the Office of Public Affairs, the Department of Justice has expedited FOIA requests involving a number of high-profile matters, such as the FBI's negotiations with the Branch Davidians at Waco. Similarly, in order to promote government openness and accountability, the Department in 1993 initiated a policy of automatically disclosing public summaries of attorney misconduct investigations that are conducted by our Office of Professional Responsibility, regardless of whether formal FOIA requests are made for those investigative files. In fact, our Office of Public Affairs now em employs a regular practice, which we recommend to other federal agencies, of trying to anticipate public demands for Department of Justice records in an effort to make information available without encumbering the FOIA process. And in order to improve the efficiency of the FOIA process itself, as well as agency accountability, Attorney General Reno has established new expanded performance standards that now apply to all department employees whose work supports FOIA administration, including line attorneys and others whose review of FOIA requests is essential before a final decision is made. The department has also sponsored a national performance review laboratory to develop an automated FOIA processing system, making good news of use of new technology, and to infuse principles of government service throughout the processes of FOIA administration. In the same vein, the Department has reviewed all of its standard forms and correspondence formats used in administration of the Act, making improvements in both content and tone, and it has assisted other agencies who are following our lead in that regard. On a day-to-day -day basis, the Department of Justice promotes government openness and encourages proper compliance with the FOIA throughout the executive branch. Through its Office of Information and Privacy, the Department provides extensive consultation and advisory assistance to all federal agencies on a wide range of FOIA-related matters. It conducts a full range of FOIA training programs for all agencies throughout the year, and it issues policy guidance to agencies through its quarterly FOIA update publication and its annual Justice Department Guide to the Freedom of Information Act. These government-wide policy activities are described in greater detail in the description of Department of Justice efforts to encourage agency compliance with the Act, which is part of the Department's annual report to Congress, the most recent copy of which is attached. Through these efforts, the Department continually strives to improve the delivery of FOIA services to the public and to assist federal agencies in meeting their statutory responsibilities as best as possible with limited resources. In closing, Mr. Chairman, the Department of Justice works hard to fulfill its responsibilities under the FOIA. In 1995, it received 133,000 FOIA and Privacy Act requests, responded to about 126,000 requests, using the equivalent of 627 full-time employees at a cost of over $36 million. The number of requests has grown exponentially in recent years. For example, since 1987, the number of requests has more than doubled. Next month, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of FOIA's enactment. As President Johnson observed when he signed the act on July 4, 1966, a democracy works best when the people have all the information that the security of the nation permits. FOIA embodies our commitment to President Johnson's pledge, and we look forward to continuing to work with the subcommittee to make FOIA work better. I'd be pleased to answer any questions the chairman or members of the subcommittee might have. Well, we thank you very much for your general testimony. Let me pursue a few questions. Uh, I have no doubt that your office does a fine job on policy development as related to the Freedom of Information Act. What concerns me is the opportunity for bureaucracies, either through the pressure of other business or whatever, downgrading the need to meet both citizen, congressional, and media inquiries. 
and I wondered to what degree do you see that as a role of your office to look around the executive branch and see how effectively each agency, bureau, department, however it's administered, is being responsive to this act? And do you have data on that? I'd like to, for example, get into which department has the longest degree, uh, delays, which bureau, agency, so forth. Do you collect that type of data? Well, the department has certain, certain responsibilities, though they are limited in overseeing um, a FOIA administration throughout the government. Um, on, under the Act, as you know, there, we, do, we do have the responsibility to encourage compliance with the Act. Let me tell you the ways in which we do that and try to respond to your question. Um, the, through the Office of Information and Privacy, um, extensive training is, is conducted each, each year. Dozens of training programs are had with every level of, the, um, of, of FOIA officials throughout the government. These training programs update FOIA officers on how to conform to the new administrative standards. They encourage more, um, they encourage, for example, aggressive, aggressive negotiation with requesters to reduce the amount of information, the scope of information that's requested. This is one of the most important initiatives that our training folks encourage because many requesters, be they media requesters or members of the general public, ask for the kitchen sink, to use the colloquialism, and in fact they would, they would be satisfied if they could get a prompt response with much less information. So th throughout, the, in these training programs, our Office of Information and Privacy alerts uh, agencies on how they can serve the public better. Um, I want to stress that while we focus on FOIA requests and what the batting average is of different agencies, that one of the most important initiatives this administration has inculcated is the, is the opportunity for affirmative disclosures without the necessity of a FOIA request. And as to that, I can speak about the department's experience because I know we've taken the lead. Our, uh, through Carl Stern, the director of our Office of Public Affairs, who's had 30 years of experience as a consumer of government information, um, he has made a number of initiatives to expand uh, access and to make requests um, act to encourage that they be acted on more timely. For example, you had asked Senator Leahy about, um, it, about whether it would be appropriate as a policy matter under his proposed legislation to accelerate media requests. The De Department of Justice um, in, uh, in this administration has created a new category of, of requests that receive expedited treatment. And those are circumstances where um, there is exceptional and widespread media interest in the subject matter, and the subject matter involves questions of possible um, abuse of government integrity. So that would include not only members of the media, but members of Congress to get expedited equip, uh, treatment so they could properly conduct hearings, I assume. If they fall within those qualifications. I mean, but does the holding of a hearing on a subject mean we too get expedited treatment to find the records so we can properly ask questions in a hearing? Well, uh, that... Or is it just the media that gets the preference? It's, it's not just media requesters who, uh, who, have, who have access to that um, expedited treatment. It's any requester who would fall within those two criteria would receive expedited treatment. Well, again, I would ask the question, do members of Congress conducting hearings on a particular subject qualify under your criteria? And, and if they, we, would we would entertain a request of that sort in the same way we would entertain any other request. Or do we have to subpoena records? I mean, that's where we are now in some cases. You just issue a subpoena. But I'd like to see something smoothly going where people could know you could ask the question and you would have the material furnished to you. Let me ask you this. Now, have you gone around and asked how much delay each agency bureau is, has in terms of responding to the series of requests they're getting? And to what type of data does the Department of Justice, your office in particular, collect on that? Um, I can speak to the, the, the information that we collect within the department because we have 
obviously a discrete responsibility for improving our own performance. Government-wide, as I said, we are in regular contact through our training programs. Training, I understand. My query is very simple. Do you ask him how many requests you have and how many months does it take you to respond? We don't have that responsibility. Okay, under so the you're saying you need the law to be changed to give someone that responsibility, I take it, in the executive branch. Is that correct? We would need guidance from, yeah. from the Congress if that were something okay. that the Department of Justice were asked to do. Yeah, do you think your office is the appropriate place, or should I, some of these laws already have OMB in it as worrying about the administration of it? Where in the executive branch do you think that responsibility to survey the timeliness of the response? Are there sufficient resources? Did the uh, office that administers this ask for the resources? Did the secretary ask? Did OMB ask? Did the president ask? Did Congress do it? And uh, where in the executive branch, in your judgment, should that be put? Mm -hmm. um, we, um, I've advised from the member of our Office of Information and Privacy that we have some of the data that you've described um, government-wide per agency, and we'll be happy to su supply that to the committee. As to your question of who, it, who is best equipped to, um, to gather that kind of information government-wide, I'd like to um, consider that and supply an answer to the committee. Fine, subcommittee. glad to have it. Gentleman from New York, uh, Major Owens. Yes, uh, Ms. Mesa, how would you say the uh, new proce the procedures in your administration differ from the procedure of the past administration uh, in terms of collection of uh, information about what's going on in the various agencies and keeping data on how, fat, how rapidly requests are met, et cetera? Anything new been added since your administration came in? Well, as I said in response to the chairman's question, um, the responsibility the department has to collect information government-wide has not changed in this administration, but we have been extremely aggressive in making sure that agencies know of the, of the measures available and the opportunities available to improve FOIA performance. And that, um, for as I mentioned, that would include opportunities to um, make information available without the need for a FOIA request. Um, we have stressed the, the uh, anticipating public uh, uh, requests for information on topics of widespread interest, making the information available in public reading rooms, um, putting information on the Internet. The Department of Justice has a website and, has a, and other agencies of the, in the government do also. I quite agree with Senator Leahy's comments that um, the accessibility of information to the public is, could be considerably enhanced through electronic means. And the department is continuing to add more information um, to its website. And I can mention a couple of um, categories of information that are already on it. All of our press releases are on it. Our Freedom of Information Guide and um, Freedom of Information Act Overview is on the internet and accessible. And the basic brochure, available in written form, of course, that guides the public in very simple, straightforward terms on how to use the FOIA is, is now posted on the internet. So these are initiatives that we've undertaken and um, we engage in consultations with other agencies to learn from them and we set the pace um, in some cases with uh, the department's initiatives. The, uh, some of the particulars that I mentioned in terms of making records on, uh, on professional misconduct by Department of Justice attorneys um, and more generally changing the administrative standards on making information available are the real hallmarks, are among the real hallmarks of th this administration's efforts to make gov government more open. So this administration has taken a more assertive and aggressive uh, posture in making information available. You don't just wait for it. Th that is a big difference between your administration and the last administration. Well, this administration uh, rescinded the previous guidelines in from 1981 which permitted the Department of Justice to defend an agency's assertion of an exemption under FOIA whenever there was a substantial legal basis for doing so. Now, uh, an agency's assertion of an exemption is defended um, only in much narrower circumstances uh, where there is a foreseeable harm to uh, a government or private interest. If, 
of the number in, in speaking just fundamentally about getting more information out, those changes in administrative and litigation guidelines um, are, are among the, the, the most significant initiatives the administration has, has, has undertaken. Do you have data which would show whether the number of, of requests have increased very much in the last three years? Uh, has there been any trend in the kind of requests that you received? I do have informa information on that. On the, on the, as I said, the number of requests to the Department of Justice have more than doubled in the last eight years. And I can provide the subcommittee with information on, if you wish, on an annual basis. But that is included in our annual report to Congress. Um, but there's no question that we are seeing exponential increases. And it is a source of frustration, but also a, a t tremendous challenge. And uh, we're doing what we can to try to improve our situation within the department. And I might like to address what we are doing to improve it within the department. When you mentioned uh, you put certain categories of information out uh, to libraries. What, yes. You mean public libraries? Yes, uh, public reading rooms. This is being done not just this, in the department. No, is this public reading rooms here in Washington, or is there some way that public libraries, depository libraries across the country, are able to get the same information so that citizens in any part of the country can get some information about your freedom of information? Those reading rooms uh, both are in Washington and in the U.S. Attorney's offices around the country who also can choose to make the, that kind of information available. U.S. attorneys are also putting uh, their press releases on the Internet, which had not heretofore been available. The Internet and the website, oh, that's your, your innovation, your, this administration, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to add a point that, um, for Mr. Chairman, that um, you, you raised in querying Senator Leahy. The answer, the answer to improving FOIA and serving our requester communities better cannot be in this day and age simply more resources. We have to be smarter and more creative about finding ways to um, avoid the FOIA, the necessity of a formal FOIA request whenever we can. Um, I think those initiatives are very important and we shouldn't lose sight of them. Not, nonetheless, um, it is the case that FOIA is both a, a blessing and a burden. We, ha we enjoy the most open democracy in the world, but um, the demands of the requester communities, whether they be media, scholars, or just curious citizens and other folks, um, are, are understandably um, greater and they need to be addressed. I think that's well put. Uh, I now yield uh, five minutes for questioning the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Blute. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you for holding this series of hearings. I want to thank the witness for testifying. Um, I'm a strong supporter of the Freedom of Information Act. I think it's a very important check on government excessive secrecy. And while some government documents should be privileged, such as FBI background checks, uh, generally speaking, government actions should be reviewed by the Congress, by the media, and ultimately by the American people. You mentioned in your testimony the selective expedited release procedure that you use in particular uh, circumstances, and I think you mentioned the Waco uh, incident. I was a member of the Waco uh, panel that uh, looked into that uh, tragic incident. Um, I seem to recall great difficulty the committee had in getting certain photographs from the Department of Justice relating to the weapons that were found there and the x-rays of those weapons to determine whether they were automatic or, or semi-automatic weapons. Uh, I wonder if you could, if you're familiar with how uh, the agency uh, handled uh, the Waco uh, requests from the media and from the Congress. Well, I was not um, specifically involved in responding to those requests. I know that, um, that requests for uh, the FBI's negotiations with the Branch Davidians were released. Um, I, We'll be happy to respond to the respond following the hearing on any other particular questions you have, um, but I was not involved with that. All right. In, in general, uh, how do you your how does your office uh, uh, decide uh, what uh, uh, what events constitute uh, uh, calling in the selective expedited release procedure? Uh, accompanying uh, my written testimony, um, Congressman, you'll see. Uh, copy of the um, memorandum that set forth the standards 
by which expedited treatment can be furnished. This is a matter of agency discretion. It's not something that we're, of course, required to do. But um, the determination was made by the Attorney General in consultation with the Director of Public Affairs that there are certain exceptional cases uh, that should be added to the two extant circumstances, threats to life or safety or loss of substantial due process rights that warranted expedited treatment. And those are circumstances where there exists widespread and exceptional media interest in the requested, requested information and where expedited processing is warranted because the information <coughs> sought involves possible questions about the government's integrity which affect public confidence. There are many different places to draw the line, I suppose, but, um, and everyone, as was, as was stated uh, by Senator Leahy, would like to have their request prioritized. But this is the line that, uh, that the department has drawn, and it's been used in a number of circumstances um, in the case of uh, high-profile um, subjects. And that ultimate decision is made by the Attorney General? Yes, and uh, it is, it is made by the Director of, of Public Affairs. With, with a review of the Attorney General? I think, I, think, I, think it's, I think it resides with the Director of Public Affairs. Let me shift gears here and ask you about uh, commercial requesters of uh, FOIA. Um, I have in my district a lot of uh, biotechnology companies, for example, who are very frustrated with the FDA's uh, long delays and their uh, backlog, and, and they, from time to time, uh, file freedom of information requests. Uh, how many of, of these types of requests do you handle, and is, do you think that that was how the act was intended? Uh, companies trying to get to the bottom of decision making within regulatory agencies. Well, um, I've I've heard that uh, FOIA is one example. I think a former law professor said it's the Taj Mahal of the doctrine of unintended consequences. And there are indeed many requesters um, who are not seeking information about what the government is doing, which one could say is the central purpose of the Freedom of Information Act, but rather information about what the government is storing. Now, Congress has not uh, made any distinction um, in terms of the, uh, the purpose of the requester or the interest the requester seeking to advance by, by seeking information, um, but it, it is certainly true that significant FOIA resources throughout the government, not so much at the Department of Justice, but in certain agencies I'm sure you'll be hearing from, absorb a considerable amount of processing time and and uh, taxpayer dollars in processing requests about competitors. There are other, ca other categories of requesters, um, likewise, who are not seeking information about what the government's doing. Uh, I think those are, those are important uh, policy questions, but they're not, uh, the, the, they're not the subject of uh, What is your uh, judgment? Do you think that restrictions of this type should be added uh, to the FOIA? Restrictions on uh, commercial uh, requests? I, I would, uh, I don't, the department doesn't have a position on that and I would, would personally not want to see us move in the direction of restriction. I'd like to see us move in the direction of, of finding more creative ways to be responsive, getting more resources when necessary, but negotiating with requesters to, to uh, reduce the amount of information they're seeking and um, using uh, automated resources and techno new technologies to be more responsive and, and I might say encouraging um, accountability for those who are involved in the process. I mentioned in my statement that um, for the first time now folks at the Department of Justice who have anything to do with, with considering a FOIA request, whether they be assistant U.S. attorneys <laughs> or people who move the paper within the department but who are not sort of formal FOIA uh, processors are now graded based on their timely performance of the FOIA-related functions. Because we learned that considerable delays occur um, before the do documents even get to the person who has to analyze whether they are exempt material or not. And so we have shined a spotlight on FOIA by making it part of the work performance standard of everyone who touches a FOIA request. And we encourage other agencies to do that. I thank you, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, five minutes to the ranking minority member from New York, Ms. Maloney, for questioning. Thank you very much. One of the versions of uh, Senator Leahy's bill 
uh, had a portion of the FOIA fees would go directly to the agency processing the FOIA request so that it would help with the resources of the agency. Um, uh, Congressman Horn and I had a similar provision in the debt collection bill that, that we passed, giving some of it back to, to the agency. Uh, what is your feeling on that particular uh, part of his bill? Would you support it? I understand that the lead with uh, the um, Senator Leahy's bill is with the Office of Management and Budget, which will be providing te uh, witness or testimony at some later date. So I would have to defer to them. So, so you, you have no comment. You will follow their suggestion. That's right. And his uh, bill separates the processing of uh, simple and complex re requests for all agencies. You mentioned that as a procedure that you're following in your agency now, but would you support that? for all agencies as a way to, to really make uh, access quicker? Again, I don't think I'm in a position to make a, a generalization about what would be best for all agencies. I think we've learned in, try, in, in our consultations with different agencies that they respond to different kinds of requests. Different, different agencies serve different requester communities. And I don't know whether an across-the-board suggestion of that kind would, um, would simplify or perhaps complicate the better performance. Well, we have many more witnesses, and I uh, would just like you to, to read uh, the, the uh, definition of record that is in the bill, and if you can think of any other way to make it more open to the public, which is the Senator said was his intent, or your um, analysis and response to it, but if you could submit it in writing, if you have any comments on it. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just round out your part of the hearing with a few questions. Some you might want to submit for the record. Some I'd like you to be working with our staff and your staff so we can get a survey we can agree on and get it back in a timely manner. Uh, do you have uh, any knowledge at this point of the average response time to a Freedom of Information Act request? We'll furnish you all these, but uh, have you got a feel for that throughout the government? What's the average response time? I do not. Uh, so your office has not collected any no. data on that. Has any office in the executive branch mm -hmm. collected data? We have some. We have certain information that we can supply to the to the committee on. Um, on backlogs and uh, whether uh, what is the extent of of requests that are backlogged more than 30 days or more than 60 days. Now, is that just a one-time survey, or do you ask that on a regular basis to see if there's any improvement? Um, the attorney general has, t as I believe, sent um, s sent two requests for this information. The the, mo the second being very recently, and we are in the process of collecting responses from agencies on the status of their backlog. Um, I will, I'm not certain it includes uh, average response time, but I will check okay. and get back to the committee. Well, let's have your staff and our staff work it out. At this, uh, the document you have will be put into the record at this point without objection, uh, because what we're interested in, just to give you an idea, and we'll expand on this, we'd like the government-wide figures to break down by department and on specific agencies that have a particular demand. Uh, such as the FBI, the Food and Drug Administration, so forth. Uh, we're interested in knowing which department has the longest delays, which department has the shortest delays. Uh, we're interested in what can be done beyond the administration's actions to speed up the process. Do we need changes in the law? Do we have to mandate this? Uh, if it isn't clear to them that we're serious, we'll be glad to make it very clear to the uh, executives and the civil servants uh, implementing this law th that we do mean business and we want the public's right to know to be fulfilled. And uh, we also like to know how long does it, uh, uh, how often does it happen that the people just move away or lose interest with the long wait? And is that part of sort of a bureaucratic pressure, if you will, uh, so that we aren't responsive in the executive branch. That concerns us. And uh, we need your advice, informally or whatever, as to how we might improve and specifically mandate that. And I realize that has to be coordinated with legislative reference in the Office of Management and Budget. But uh, we would welcome your thoughts on this, formally or informally. At least and briefly, Mr. Chairman, excuse me for interrupting. I, uh, sure. The information I can supply today identifies the 28 agencies that have no FOIA backlog, um, the 18 agencies that report a backlog between 15 and 30 days, 
uh, 29 agencies that have backlogs of more than 30 days. Um, now, and do we know who has a backlog of more than a year? We can supply, I think we can supply that information, yes. Do you know at all now who has a black backlog more than a year? Um, the, the FBI does. Um, now, is it correct that the information we were given by them is they have a four-year backlog? It and is, this is responsiveness? It is a tremendous challenge. And Anybody in that category besides the FBI? I will supply that to the subcommittee if there are any others. Yeah. And yet hundreds of files get delivered to the White House and they don't even have a signed request from the White House. They just send them over there. So that bothers us, shall we say. But as I said, we'll pursue that one next week. Uh, should use of the act be limited to United States citizens or permanent residents? And I mention that because apparently the U.S. government felt it was required by the act to turn over the information in its files to the Ayatollah Khomeini about the Shah of Iran. And I wonder if uh, the uh, Ayatollah was ever put in a queue like the rest of us are. I mean, can we look into what happened on that? I mean, and should we be permitting outsiders, if you will, who aren't citizens or permanent residents to request information? And is that a problem? Mm -hmm. How much of that are you getting? And I must say I am concerned about the commercial mischief with FDA. It's one thing to request types of data that help people in the public interest or uh, see if some uh, idiot patent medicine is underway that we don't want to suffer and kill people and all the rest. That I understand. What I don't understand we have to do is have the government be part of a commercial intelligence operation to undercut the creative rights of people that are filing various things with the FDA who can then just simply file, get their ideas, go out and make trouble and lawsuits and everything else and in essence steal from creative people. And I just wonder, is your office, which is engaged in policy formulation, taking a look at that? Here we are, we're arguing with the Chinese, we're arguing with everybody in the world on stealing our intellectual property. And one could make the case that right under our nose, due to FOIA, intellectual property is being stolen from a lot of people that have invested their labor, their dedication, their money, everything else, so that somebody can get it and then challenge them, the actual inventor of it. That bothers me. And does it bother the Department of Justice? Does it bother your office? Well, as I said, we would be happy to work with the subcommittee in considering the, those issues. It is something that we keep our eye on in terms of trying to get a sense of who our users are, what, yeah. what constituencies are growing. Um, you know, there's a, there's a perception that media occupy a very, very significant portion of FOIA requesters, and that's not the case at the Department of Justice. Um, so it's certainly something we'd be happy to work with the subcommittee staff in considering. Now, do you, ha you heard the discussion with Senator Leahy. Do you have any reaction to his proposal? OMB is taking the lead on S-1090, and I understand they will be furnishing uh, testimony before okay. the subcommittee. Uh, and has the Department of Justice filed its views with OMB for the normal clearance review over there? I do not know, but will advise the subcommittee on that. Well, the reason I ask is uh, we're in sort of an expedited procedure here. We're going to be moving very fast on this bill, and I would say we would love to have the views of the affected agencies, obviously, and we're going to really need them within the next two weeks because uh, we only have so many legislative days to go. Uh, now, do you have a view on the implementation of the Privacy Act at all? OMB takes the lead under the statute on the Privacy Act, Mr. Chairman. And so have your views been filed with OMB or can your views be filed with this committee because we're going to be getting into that also? On what subject involving the Privacy Act? Act. Uh, what in particular? Well, just in general. What, what is your experience with it? We're, we're interested in getting the feedback of those of you on the firing line in making sure that these laws are effective. If there's something we have failed to do, and that's not unusual around here, where we've put a euphemism in the law to get agreement, and then you all sit around and say, what in heaven's name do they mean by this word? If we've got that problem, 
we need to surface it on the table in this go-around and in the Leahy bill or the Horn bill or the Horn Maloney bill, whatever, we want to clarify some of these things so you don't have to go through that problem. So we'd welcome, all I'm saying is we'd welcome your suggestions. Uh, one of the last questions, uh, we're going to also consider tomorrow um, the health information privacy protection uh, proposal that uh, Mr. Condon of California took the lead in in the last Congress. Uh, he unfortunately will not be able to be here tomorrow when we consider some of that, but he is working very closely with us on a joint proposal of myself and him uh, to update that and to improve uh, some of the protections in it. So we would love to have any views you've got for informally or formally based on the experience you see throughout the country on this one. And we heard in the hearings we held under Mr. Condit's leadership in the last Congress, we had a real tale of horrors of what happens to medical records in some hospitals in this country. And I think uh, we want to do something about that. So again, we would welcome uh, your thinking. And uh, Mrs. Maloney's bill will be up tomorrow on the War Crimes Disclosure Act. Uh, we want to move that right along. And we would uh, also welcome, does Justice have any views on that particular proposal? Because if you've got them, we're going to need them in the next two weeks because we're going to move that one very rapidly also. Uh, so uh, those are just sort of little teasers to say we'd like your help and cooperation on this. We'd like your staff and our staff to get together under Russell George, who's seated to my left, the staff director. And we would like to get an agreement on a survey so we can really find out what the agencies, the departments are doing in terms of responsiveness to the citizen requests. How long is it taking? And I'm going to be asking each one here, but I'd like to, there, a lot of departments aren't going to be here. Most departments aren't. I'm going to ask the simple question. What's the average time? How many requests? Have you asked for the money? Did you ask the cabinet officer for the money and the resources? Can the department reprogram those resources so it isn't always asking for money? Just use some common sense. And uh, that's uh, some of the major operations in a number of departments where they come into citizen contact. And we want to be effective on that. So if, does any member have any other questions of the Deputy Attorney General? Very well. Thank you very much for Thank coming. You, Mr. You're welcome. We now move to panel three, and uh, we have Mr. Kevin O'Brien, the section chief for the Freedom of Information Privacy Act section of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Anthony H. Information and Security Review, Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs. You gentlemen will uh, stand, raise your right hand. Uh, in the testimony that you're about to give this subcommittee, do you affirm that this is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Both witnesses have affirmed. Uh, we'll begin in alphabetical order uh, with uh, Mr. O'Brien. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of uh, Director Louis J. Free, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before your subcommittee about the FBI's Freedom of Information and Privacy Acts program. The FBI has made a significant commitment of people and resources to process requests for information under the Freedom of Information Act and the Privacy Act. But despite these efforts, we are dealing with a large volume of work on hand and we are not able to process requests in as timely a manner as we would like. In calendar year 1995, the FBI spent $21 million on the FOIPA program. The FBI processes most FOIPA requests centrally in the FOIPA section at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. A relatively small amount of FOIPA processing is done in field offices. The FOIPA section currently has a net of 239 full-time employees working on the, in the program. As well, there are another 11 assigned to a FOIPA module in Savannah, Georgia, and another 74 analysts, some full and some part-time, are spread throughout FBI field offices. Because of the nature of the FBI's main mission, which is to uphold the law through investigation of federal criminal laws, to protect the United States from foreign counterintelligence activities, and to provide leadership and law enforcement assistance to federal, state, local, and international agencies, the Bureau is involved in a wide variety of activities which often involve sensitive factors. 
in processing FBI documents for release under the FOIPA, great care is taken to ensure that no material to which the requester is entitled is erroneously held and that no material that should be withheld is inadvertently released. A disclosure analyst conducts a line-by-line, -line, page by page review of the work copy of documents to determine what should be released and whether any FOIPA exemption should be applied. Analysts must decide how much information can be disclosed to the requester without harming national security, revealing confidential sources, invading personal privacy, interfering with ongoing investigations, disclosing specialized investigative techniques while revealing other sensitive information. On the whole, FBI files contain very sensitive information, and the review of this type of information is necessarily time-consuming, and the analysis cannot be done properly if it is done in haste. The analyst uses a special marking pen to edit exempt material and thereafter marks and identifies the, doc the exemptions used in the margin of the documents. During the process, sometimes other government agencies must be consulted about the releasability of their information or documents uh, which may be found in FBI files if they are in the files being processed. Uh, the, the process requires a thorough supervisory review to ensure legibility, completeness, and accuracy, and then the materials to be released are sent to the requester. As of May 31, 1996, we had the FBI Section had 15,259 requests on hand, and it's estimated that there are approximately over 5,400,000 pages of documents to be reviewed. Because of the FBI's work, investigative files can range from relatively small to very large and complex. Of these 15,000 requests, we estimated about 2,000 of them consist of an average of 100 pages or less and are not complex. At the other end of the spectrum are project cases, which we define as consisting of 3,000 pages or more. At the end of May 1996, we had 248 project cases, which involve an estimated 2,600,000 pages to be reviewed. The remainder of the requests for which responsive files had been identified would consist of between 100 and 3,000 pages and in varying degrees of complexity. The cases in the FBI's backlog span the full range of the FBI's work. I've added some, I've shown percentages here, but they, they uh, are on the range of cases including white collar crime, organized crime, foreign counterintelligence, terrorism, civil rights, applicant cases, and miscellaneous cases and other criminal cases. Types of requesters in 1975 were predominantly, predominantly private individuals, 74 percent, followed by prisoners, almost 15 percent, and scholars, historians, news media members, freelance writers and authors, organizations, and current employees. There are a number of factors which contribute to the growth of the backlog of requests. First is a constant stream of, of a high volume of new requests received, an average of about 13,100 in each of the last five years. In addition, we've lost some experienced analysts through attrition from transfers to other positions and retirements. In addition, because of the nature of the FBI's investigative files, many requests involve complex processing decisions that are time consuming. Some requests also are, involve voluminous records. The 248 project cases I mentioned previously are only 1.6% of the pending requests, but represent 48% of the estimated pages to be reviewed. As an example, three project cases currently being processed are for records consisting of approximately 80,000. 55,000 and 32,000 pages respectively. When these requests have been completed, thousands of hours of processing time will have been expended. In addition, FOIP analysis sometimes diverted away to ha from handling initially process processing of requests to other ex essential activities. Administrative appeals must be addressed. As of May 31st, we had 480 requests on appeal. Uh, moreover, litigation has significantly drawn an analyst time. At the end of May 1996, there were 233 pending FOIPA lawsuits involving 641 requests. Uh, our analysts spent a significant amount of time on litigation, 10% in 1992, 20% in 1993, almost 30% in 1994, 20% in 1995. Uh, this is, these litigations must be responded to. Frequently, there are court audit deadlines, and we must provide justifications for what we've done. Because of uh, their analytical experience, also some FOIP plans are diverted to other analogous functions. 
We have 12 of our analysts are assigned to the John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Task Force, uh, which has processed and released to the National Archives over 640,000 pages of assassination records in response to legislation passed by Congress in 1992. And they will continue to work there until that project is completed. Um, whenever analysts are diverted to other tasks, they cannot, such as the litigation's administrative appeals and the John F. Kennedy Assassination Materials Task Force, they are taken away from performing the initial processing of FOIPA requests. Another factor which has added to complexity and made analyst processing activities more time consuming uh, involves changes in processing rules. In 1993, the Supreme Court, in a decision, U.S. Department of Justice against Londano, a rule the government was not entitled to a presumption that all sources supplying information to the FBI in criminal cases are confidential sources. It had been the, the law in the majority of federal circuits up to that time, and this decision overturned it. As well, in, in October 93, Attorney General Reno announced a discretionary release policy for Department of Justice components. And in both of these instances, these, these new policy changes uh, require a greater amount of analysis and therefore a greater amount of time. They both have the virtue of resulting in a greater amount of disclosure material, but the, another consequence of it is to make the processing much more time consuming and longer. The FBI has taken several measures to deal with the backlog of requests. In order to treat requests as equitably, requests are assigned based on their approximate date of receipt. We've employed a two-track system whereby smaller cases can be processed more expeditiously as time and resources permit, and therefore are able to serve more requesters than we would if all cases were kept in one queue. We've also streamlined processes. For example, we've clarified form letters and converted forms to computerized macros to diminish the amount of typing time expended. We also form and use ad hoc teams to process large and complex requests. We've taken several internal measures to bring more personnel time and resources to bear on processing the FOIPA requests in the headquarters backlog. We've used overtime in the FOIPA section. Beginning in 1989, we began training field office analysts to do the more complex work found in the headquarters backlog, and they supplement our headquarters analyst force by processing backlog cases as time permits. In addition, in 1992, we developed and trained an off-site FOIPA module in Savannah, Georgia, which, which functions uh, as a team would at uh, FBI headquarters and processes headquarters backlog cases. Uh, in 1992, from internal resources, we added and trained 15 new disclosure analysts at FBI headquarters. Again, in 1995, uh, Director Free uh, added 17 more di disclosure analysts from within headquarters and added 34 new document classification analysts, 20 of whom will be devoted to the classification aspects of processing FOIPA requests. We have also initiated and continue to develop the FOIPA document processing system, which is an initiative to automate the physical aspects of FOIPA document processing through computerization. The project has been recognized as part of a national performance review laboratory, and research and development stage is nearly concluded. Once development developed, the system will have potential applications for FOIPA and civil discovery document processing that will be of benefit to other agencies beyond the FBI should they choose to use it, and it should result in a saving of analyst time as well as other beneficial effects. It is clear, however, that only more analysts trained to process requests can significantly diminish the backlog absent an unexpected decrease in new requests. The FBI is seeking additional personnel resources through the budget process, and a request for 129 additional personnel to process FOIPA requests is now pending before the Congress. I am pleased that during the first five months of 1996, the backlog has not grown. On December 31, 1995, there were 15,358 requests on hand, and on May 31, 1996, there were 15,259. However, we would much prefer to significantly diminish the size of the backlog of requests so that requesters' needs may be served in a more timely fashion. I assure you that with whatever resources are available to us, we are committed to continuing to do high-quality work in processing FOIPA requests and to continue our best efforts to reduce the backlog. This concludes my prepared statement. I thank you, and I'd be happy to address any questions. Uh, thank you. We'll uh, wait till we have the next witness, and then we'll open it up to a questioning by the committee. Mr. Passarella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Anthony H. Passarella, Director of the Directorate for Freedom of Information and Security Review, Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs. 
I am pleased to have the opportunity to discuss the Department of Defense's Freedom of Information Act program with you today. The Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs has overall policy implementation authority to administer the DOD FOIA program. He has charged my directorate to carry out this responsibility. The DOD implementation of the FOIA is set forth in DOD Directive 5400.7, which further authorizes publication of DOD Regulation 5400.7-R. The Directorate for Freedom of Information and Security Review develops the FOIA policy for DOD and processes requests for records under the control of the Office of Secretary of Defense, the Office of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Joint Staff. I am not responsible for the DOD Privacy Act program, but my directorate does process individual Privacy Act requests. My directorate also conducts security review of all material prepared for public release and publication originated by the DOD to include testimony before congressional committees or by contractors, DOD employees as individuals, and materials submitted by sources outside the DOD for such review. The director also conducts the mandatory declassification review, review program for OSDOJCS. Because of the mission functions and size and geographic dispersion of the DOD, it is decentralized into separate military departments and defense agencies. The FOIA, FOIA program is likewise decentralized in the DOD components. The DOD components consist of 15 separate organizations, inclusive of the military departments and separate defense agencies, located across the nation and around the world. These, these DOD components conduct their own FOIA programs under the policy guidance of the DOD FOIA regulation, which is written by my office. The components responsible requires them to respond to requests for records under their control, make release determinations on records originated in the component, refer requests for other records to other FOIA offices as appropriate, review adverse determinations on appeal, and work in concert with the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's Office in FOIA litigation. As I said, my directorate processes FOIA initial requests and appeals for one of these components, the OSD OJCS. Consisting of 80 staff offices in OSD, the Office of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Joint Staff. We also refer requests to other DOD components as appropriate, process appeals of initial denials of those records of nine unified commands worldwide, and conduct, uh, coordinate with the Department of Justice and the Attorney's Office in FOIA litigation like the DOD components alluded to earlier. The DOD receives a wide variety of requests throughout the department, nationally and worldwide. Many of the requests involve classified information, which can be as recent as the ongoing operations in Bosnia or as old as World War I or World War II information which may still require protection. Other records, while residing physically at the National Archives and Records Administration, must often be reviewed by area experts in the DOD. Some of the other types of requests the Department of reads are requests for the following records. Bids or proposals during the contracting process, contracts themselves, mailing lists, current and historical policy papers on a multitude of subjects, descriptions and analysis of military weapons, nuclear information, technical data information, lessons learned on completed operations such as Desert Storm, Granada, etc., alleged human rights abuses in various other nations, including El Salvador, Guatemala, and Bosnia, human radiation experimentation, AIDS, personal files under the Privacy Act, and attempts to locate long-lost relatives. Requests are received from all types of requesters, private individuals all over the world, commercial organizations, nonprofit organizations, news media and law firms representing a multitude of clients. <clears throat> Due to the size and complexity of the DOD, there is no central repository of all DOD records, nor a single office that has sufficient knowledge on all of the many subjects to process them. For this reason, because the originator of the information must make a disclosure decision on that information, the public is asked to direct its request to the proper DOD component, which they believe may have responsive records. The addresses of these components are published in each component's FOIA regulation, all of which are published in the Code of Federal Regulations. Therefore, if someone desires information located at one of the Army installations, the Army regulation asks the requester to write directly to that installation, which, which will then respond to the requester. To prepare the response, records are reviewed by subject matter experts at the installation to ensure that all pertinent information can be released and that information that sh should be withheld is not released. All of the military departments and separate defense agencies have personnel at their base, the bases, installation, or ship level who, in concert with their other duties, have been assigned FOIA duties as well. Should a requester seek information on Secretary of Defense policy issues which originated in OSD, 
The request normally should be sent to my directorate in the Pentagon, which will task the request to the appropriate office or offices in the OSD and or OJCS for record search. On the other hand, and as frequently happens, should a request arrive at my FOIA office for records pertaining to events which occurred at one of the decentralized FOIA components, my directorate would refer the request in writing to the appropriate FOIA component, which in turn would forward it in writing to the appropriate FOIA office to prepare the response. The requester would receive a letter from my director informing him or her of this referral. Referrals are necess necessary for the reasons of physical location of responsive records, subject matter expertise, and the responsibilities of originators of information, which I mentioned earlier. This obviously delays a response to the request, but unfortunately cannot be avoided. Another area which creates delay in responding to requests are requests for large volumes of historical classified information. It is not uncommon to receive stacks of top secret documents measuring anywhere from 12 to 24 inches high from the National Archives and Records Administration asking that they be reviewed for release under the FOIA. Re review of classified information must be done line by line to ensure no information is inadvertently released that would damage national security. In addition, classified information offers, often requires coordination with other federal agencies involved in national security, and this too takes time. DOD FOIA program is a very large volume program involving thousands of documents. As an example, the DOD received 107,486 requests and 1,303 appeals in 1994, 103,347 requests and 899 appeals in 1995. While the numbers of requests have decreased over the past two years, the sophistication of the request has increased and are for larger numbers of records. These factors have made the process more difficult. A great deal of DOD time is spent processing FOIA requests for a relatively small group of prolific requesters who continually seek vast quantities of classified historical data, which has long been retired either to the Federal Records Storage Area in Suitland, Maryland, or has been accessioned to, by the NARA. Retrieving records from the record storage area takes time, and review of large volumes of classified material also takes time, as mentioned earlier. What steps can be taken to improve this process is a difficult question to answer. For one thing, I doubt if the original framers of the FOIA ever intended to be used by people and organizations throughout the world for profit-making ventures. The Supreme Court has emphasized the core purpose of the FOIA is to be providing information on the operations of the government, but it is clearly used for much more than that. The DOD will have to explore more ways to capitalize on technology as one method of improving processing times, as well as continuing its emphasis on personalized training of FOIA personnel and those who must make decisions on release of information under the FOIA. However, I must emphasize that with the current thrust in downsizing, it will be difficult to do more and do it quicker with fewer assets. In closing, I ask you to remember that no matter how technology advanced we may become and how many personnel we may hire, Extreme care must always be taken to ensure that no information detrimental to our national security is disclosed. This will always take careful, thoughtful, human review and time. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, on this round of questioning, each member will have uh, ten minutes because uh, I think each of us has a series we'd like to get out and uh, not uh, lead off in other directions. So I'd like both of you gentlemen to respond to some of these. Some of these toward the end are exclusively defense, but I'd like to get both justice perspective and defense and get into access questions. Are there any and all documents in your agency uh, available to members of Congress who request them, or are they subject to a need-to-know test? What's the answer to that? If a member of Congress filed, I'm not getting into the media now, I'm just filing, let's say, in reference to work of their committees, and we file for particular information, uh, are they subject to a need-to-know test? Sir, I can't honestly answer that question, but in my opinion, if it's for the use of the committee, it can be handled through a con what's called a congressional inquiry, and that is not something that my office processes, sir. Who processes that? I believe that's done through legislative affairs within the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Now, you're saying legislative affairs could override your office? No, no sir. You, are you saying your committee submitted a FOIA request or your committee... Uh, well, we would submit a request for documents. I'm just curious how the process works. In other words, you've got trained people there that are used to going through records, be it the media, be it the average citizen, be it a member of Congress, be it the Ayatollah Khomeini, I guess, based on that previous example. 
but uh, I just need to know when you're looking for information in an agency where a lot of information is classified and it might be historic information and it at one time might have been either confidential secret or top secret or some other category undefined. Uh, what I would need to know here is if documents, certain specific documents were asked, uh, would there, besides the classification, let's say, that those documents might have 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. You mentioned the First World War, which I do want to pursue sometime. Uh, but uh, is there also a needs-to-know test? If it's in the performance of government business, sir, I would imagine you would not have to use the FOIA to obtain those documents. Okay. Uh, and so if a congressional committee made a request for documents, I want to be very specific. Uh, if they were there, uh, would we be told they're there? And let's say there was a decision made, well, you really can't release these for one reason or another. Uh, I'm just curious how that system works. I can't imagine, sir, if a congressional committee asked the Department of Defense for documents that they would not be provided. Uh, that's my personal opinion. I hope you're right, because we're going to put them to the test in a few months. But that's, I'm sir. laying the groundwork for this just to make sure what we're asking for. As uh, one good friend of mine on the other side of the aisle said, Steve, you've got to ask the specific question or you're not going to get the answer out of them. That was said after 30 years' experience with the Department of Defense. So uh, I'm curious, is there a need-to-know test beyond whatever Sir, I'd classification? Sir, I'd have to take that question. I, I do not know the answer okay. to that. Well, at this point, in any requests that have come from the average citizen, from the media, whoever, when it gets in your shop and you first decide now, is this accessible? And uh, it could be an old classification. Maybe it was never classified. Does somebody in your shop still have a need-to-know criteria? Because that's the way it goes sometimes, as you and I know, on classification. You can be top secret, but you don't have yes, a need-to-know. Uh, if, if a request came into my office for a, a classified document, it, we, would, we would send that request to the appropriate individual or office that would hold that document. That document would be re reviewed for releasability and segregability. And if it was segregable, it would be provided to my, doc, uh, to my office to respond back to the requester. If it was denied, then it would not be provided, i.e., if it was still remain classified. In other words, you take the word of the classifying office as yes, to whether sir. that ought to be open public information. Yes, sir. The classifying office is the one that has the responsibility for both classifying the document and for declassifying the document, the way the DOD is organized. Okay. Now, let's say they don't want to declassify the document. Would you tell the requester such documents exist, but they are classified? We would normally tell them that their request for documents has been located, but unfortunately they're denied for the appropriate reasons under the FOIA. Okay. As long as there's harm to the government, they would be denied. If there's no harm, then of course we would release the documents. Mm -hmm. And it's the classifying office that makes the decision as to where the harm to the government is. Yes, sir. Is there an appeal process over yes, that sir, classifying office? The, Who administers the, that? Our office runs the appellate process. And what will happen is when the, uh, the appeal comes in, we would obtain the document and it would be reviewed by taking into account their recommendations, our experience to determine if their denial was correct. It would be reviewed by the Office of General Counsel to ensure that they were properly in, uh, utilizing the FOIA exemptions and then it would go to my boss for an appellate response. Mm -hmm. And uh, to your knowledge, has the need to know test ever been required in any documents that have passed through your office? as an additional criteria. In other words, it isn't enough to say they're classified or they're unclassified, but does that person really need to know? No, no, sir. That it, isn't applied? That is not the, if it's being released, sir, it's, that it's a publicly available. You're machine. saying anybody could know it at that point? Well, not everybody has access to all the documents until it's right. been through the pro FOIA process. When it's been through the FOIA process and it's made available to the public, anybody can have that particular document after it's finished. Okay, let's say uh, they declassify it, but they don't want to share the document. It's declassified, but they just don't think it's a good idea to share it. They have to have a, a reason for denying it, sir. It must have an exemption under the FOIA. If they've declassified it and there's no other FOIA exemption that fits it, we release it. 
Okay, so in other words, you're telling me that documents over there would either be marked confidential, secret, or top secret if they're not to be made publicly available? Or no, made... sir, because there are other reasons that documents would not be released. For example, under the FOIA, if they were a pre-decisional document, it may very well be an unclassified document, but about a, a pending decision to be made which has not been made yet. And that would not become uh, available to the public under the B-4 exemption. And, and what is the criteria by which that document is still with It's a pre-decisional document as set forth in the Freedom of Information Act. It's which means the, what? Give me an example. Um, a new policy being created about the employment of, of, of ships. I, I'm, I'm stretching here. And uh, they haven't decided yet what they're going to do or how they're going to go about doing it. And the decision hasn't been made that they're going to increase the deployment times from six months to eight months, and they, they're gathering all of the information as to whether that would be a good idea, and no decision has been made yet. That's that's exempt under the FOIA. Okay. In other words, you're saying it's one of the nine exemptions under yes, the Act. Yes, sir. And when that document is denied, it is one of the specific nine exemptions are stated as the basis for denial. Yes, sir. So you're saying that those are the ones you rely on, not the sort of vague judgment as to need to know. That's correct, sir. Okay. It must meet a FOIA exemption in order to be denied. All right. Now, uh, when a member of uh, Congress uh, requests something for which he or she or the committee uh, is not determined to have any need to know, is that person told that there are no documents in this area, or is that person told that not certain documents are not being received because they either come under the nine exceptions or they're still classified? I'm, tr I'm trying to get at, uh, do we admit the documents are there, but sorry you can't have them, or do we just say no documents are available? I don't know, sir. I'd have to go back and, and get an answer for the record on that. Uh, have you ever had a case that comes to your memory like that? No, sir. Okay. Uh, and you're telling me that, uh, the say the President of the United States asked for certain documents. Is he automatically going to get them out of the Department of Defense, or is there a reason not to give documents I, I to the President? I cannot imagine a reason that we would not give whatever the President asked for. Uh, I would hope the Commander-in-Chief would have a little priority to get to the head of the line. Uh, the queue is... But he would is. never have to invoke the FOIA, though, sir. Yeah. Uh, he'd just send a little message over and the documents had come. And we're going to get into next week who says messages, who sends messages to whom, and do they even sign their name to them? Uh, you're telling me that the need to know is not really a criterion in your operation; that it's either the nine exceptions or it's classified. Is that it? That's a hard way. The document is either classified are exempt from release from one of the nine exemptions of the FOIA, including B-1 being one of the, class the classification issues. If it's not fitting that exemption, it is released. Okay. Now, does the Pentagon consider the need-to-know category a exemption? No, sir. So it would have to be then either secret, top secret, or confidential. Is that right? To, to have not a release to know issue. It to have a need-to-know issue. Yeah, because as you know, uh, usually you can have top-secret clearance, but you don't have a need-to-know, and therefore documents in the military can be denied fellow yes, officers and listed personnel in the, in the that military. What I want to know is, is the need-to-know vague category, or specific as it might be on the, the basis of who's got access, is that used anywhere in the FOIA process, Freedom yes, of Information Act? It isn't used anywhere. So the, what you deal with then is something, again, that is confidential, secret, or top secret, and it's or in one of those exceptions. If it's confidential, secret, or top secret, you don't release it unless they change the classification. No, sir. It, for example, if it's a top secret document, and we review many, many of those, uh, the document has gone through line by line to identify what in that particular mm. document is classified. That, so it would be redacted? That information would be redacted. In and brief, the, blanked out. And blanked out, and the redacted information would be released to the requester, and he would be explained as to as the rationale for that, that redaction. 
Okay, we'll pursue some of this a little later. I want to yield to the ranking minority member, Ms. Maloney. Ten minutes for questioning. You, you mentioned in both of you in your testimony the need for, for resources to process the hundreds of thousands of requests. In the absence of uh, further resources, what would you recommend to improve the processing of FOIA requests? Well, we have, we have done a lot to refine our processes, uh, Congresswoman, uh, over the years, and we're always looking for new ways to do it better. Um, we do, uh, on occasion, have the, uh, our personnel telephonically contact requesters to try to focus their requests. Sometimes requests are uh, uh, not well focused, and we try to have some personal telephonic contact to try to um, uh, meet the needs of the requesters. As well, we use an automated search of our indices uh, and are able to give answers in a short time if we have, have no record in the automated searches. We have formed that with large requests. And in fact, uh, this document processing system that I talked about, which will, will help to process with optical scan and storage of the record electronic way, uh, somewhat in time. I Say, but it would help on the physical part. FOIP a document process part process for the analyst. Judgments cannot be speed. They have to be carefully done. Carefully done. And that kind of they also go through a laboratory process so when they redact of actually magic marker like be Xerox checked to make sure you can't read through and, and, and uh, decide, a supervisor decides it shouldn't be redacted, has come out, bleach and bleach it out, or they re Xerox the original and go back and do it over again. Laborious. You talk about technology lacking. I mean, we're, we're in the dark ages on it. Very, very laborious process, but if we, if we get the computerization, that part, the physical part, we greatly speed it up as well. We will cut down on time because we will have no possibility of error in those things. And therefore, analysts doing essentially physical, non-analytical work, non work of checking to be careful there's no physical error, that will go by the wayside. So that would be very important. In connection with trying to develop this project, Martin Mary and an independent contractor looked at our processes in 1990, all work processes, and they concluded there was no significant re-engineering we could do in processing that would, would, would. So we really are faced with uh, grant maybe in the Civil War, getting enough on the line to fight the fight as, as, as well in a high quality manner, I think. We're open to any suggestions, however, believe me. We, we. Mr. O'Brien, I have a testing for the FBI myself. And uh, last night I spoke to a colleague of mine, uh, Jorsky, and he files on him two years. Wait. It's in effect. Request is actual. Treat them in the order. It's a relatively small, 100 page. Uh, it's in the track one queue. Now to be in the track two queue. As of now, we're assigning in the track one queue that we received as of October. Sign them to a disclosure. So take a, l a little bit so that uh, the size average my FBI and I'd like some.
uh, Congressman Mc Pennsylvania. The cop and uh, that uh, a considerably trying earlier. trial that he is facing put him back uh, uh, there were by 1992 that probably not get the files just would like your response I saw that article uh, you who may the reason, important reason. Let, let me. There are free of information or private. Uh, there are three expediting requests, which are the. They involve threat of a loss of substantial. Uh, or a situation media interest in and Alex McDay's request it met the criteria Department of Justice and um, and for the Department of Justice makes the third of those criteria is widespread media interest in an allegation of government wrongdoing Mr. McDade has an administrative he has, he has let me, an allegation make, of government wrongdoing does. There's an allegation of Mr. McDay. There's a trial, so criteria in that category that it did not. And I, I do not on his case, trial charged with criminal. There is a different procedure. Procedure. That's with the government. Mr. McDade has been under indictment for some years. Now, I think this week, Pennsylvania, that is a separate process is what I'm trying to say, that what criminal defendants can get in terms of discovery from the government for their defense. The Freedom of Information Act. Um, waiting four years. I will have to wait for estimating. At the article said that, he, that uh, you had to, to get back to Mr. McDade certified that it was his my request, so we don't have to go. So, um, <laughs> okay. Here's you estimate. Uh, Congresswoman, if we get more resources, that won't, that won't, I have to give you an honest very sorry. We're not happy saying all. And I'm not happy all every day. And uh, we would like to quickly. If I could the article about getting if it was That, and it I, came I, so you just send it back or I signature from somebody in the office that, but that, that time frame So I'd like to is the need it takes to respond. 
am I in the fast track? No, that track? is a pro that is a projection out based upon wh where we are in assigning cases that are ready for assignment now to our disclosure analysts. In fact, in 1995, uh, the average turn the average turnaround time for cases that required processing and, and to release was uh, 923 days. Uh, for all requests, it was 292 days in 90, uh, 1995. All requests would include those needing processing and those which we determined relatively early in the, that there was no record responsive to the request. And what is the uh, median number of pages in a FOIA request, or in a FOIA response, rather? Roughly 100 pages, or is there a median number? I, I don't have that information available. I think that, you know, as I indicated, um, a lot of our requests are over 100. We, we estimate there are 2,000, maybe a little more in our uh, work on hand now that are 100 or less, average of 100 or less. So probably the average FOIA response would be larger, larger than that, I would think. And uh, my time is up, but maybe the... Chairman, well, let me ask very quickly, what proportion of your records are stored electronically now? In the FBI? Uh -huh. um, we have paper files. We're starting, and that is a, we have paper files and documents are being created electronically. I uh, think that, though, they're probably all stored in a paper way at the time. The, uh, the objective of the Bureau is to go into the uh, paperless environment. That's one of the that's one of the information management objectives of the Bureau, and w they've made substantial progress in going in that direction. But I cannot speak uh, to what is the nature of the, the records being created now. Most of the records to which uh, FOIA requests are responsive are records prior to this time, and they're, they're paper records. So the, we process paper records in this process. Uh, thank you. Before I yield ten minutes to Mr. Flanagan, I want to pursue one or two things that uh, Ms. Maloney elicited. Uh, you mentioned the McDade case. Uh, now, if the United States Attorney asked for the McDade file, would that go through your office, or is there a separate process for them to gain access to the McDade file? Th that would not go through my office. There would be a separate process. Who, who runs that process? Well. I would think an investigative file uh, would be located in the field office where the, where the investigation took place as well. It would be a corresponding headquarters file. And uh, the field office, in working with the prosecutor, would, would be dealing and sharing the information and, and documents as needed to, to, to help prosecute the case. That might be the day-to-day -day way that things like that are done. Uh, if there was some specific request, it might go through uh, our Office of General Counsel, perhaps, here in Washington. Well, we'll ask staff to check it. This seems to me, Ms. Maloney raised a very fine point there, that if the individual on trial cannot have the file and the prosecuting attorney can have the file, it seems to me justice isn't being done here. Now, you mentioned discovery quite properly. It would seem to me that if the judge issued an order, that ought to solve the problem. On the other hand, if the judge, I don't know whether the judge was asked or not in this case, and just since it's come up, I think we need staff to round out the file on this. Who's had access? Where do you go to get access? Where was access denied? And uh, I'm obviously concerned, and we, as I said, we'll get into this next week, but when 339 files that we know of, and it could be 600 since they're presumably only down to the G's where my staff director is included in the White House request for files, uh, even though none of them must have been under consideration uh, for a position, but when uh, the White House counsel can, doesn't even have to sign it, but his name's on it, the FBI suddenly delivers 339 files. They sit over in the White House for months, years, I don't know. We'll get all that straightened out next week. And it, would any of that come through your office, or does that come from a different office in the FBI? It would not come through my office. Which office would handle that? I'm, I'm not sure exactly. Okay. We'll, we'll get that for the record then. Uh, here's where I'm headed. When I see the misuse of FBI files by members of the White House staff, and whether it be the Nixon staff or the Clinton staff, I'm going to put in a bill that says if you want to file out of the FBI, the President of the United States must have his signature on that request. 
And now it's perfectly appropriate if he's thinking about appointing somebody for the Supreme Court of the United States, he ought to have the file, if there is a file, and have access to that before he makes an offer and embarrasses somebody when, and that's happened as we all know, uh, when you have a full field investigation or even they didn't tell him the obvious. And the FBI's had some problems in that area, not doing a thorough uh, evaluation on a few justices I can think about. But uh, it just seems to me that we've, some people have easy access because they pick up the phone and they're the White House and they get any file they want. And the average citizen, including a member of Congress in Ms. Maloney's case, who wants her file, has to sit around for four years. I find that a little problem, shall we say. I'm going to now yield 10 minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, the Vice Chairman, Mr. Flanagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. O'Brien, thanks for coming today, by the way. Your testimony you. was enlightening. Uh, the nine exemptions uh, to a FOIA request, are there any exceptions to those exemptions? Is, is it possible that there is a competing interest that outweighs the interest in the exemption? Well, I think rather than saying exceptions to the exemptions, there are competing interests, and the exemptions only, only apply uh, if um, concepts and parameters of the, accept, uh, of the exemption apply. In other words, I think the, the way you have to start out conceptually with the Freedom of Information Act is it's a disclosure statute. And if a person makes a request, whatever records are responsive to their request should be disclosed to them unless an exemption applies. So you start out first with the concept we're going to disclose, and then it's unless an exception applies. So. In, in applying the, the exemptions, uh, there are, for example, uh, some which involve uh, taking in a competing interest. The, for example, the privacy exemptions, B6 and B7C, uh, involves a balancing of, on the one hand, the individual's privacy right and the degree of the privacy. Is it great? For example, of personal medical records, very, very high value of privacy. Some other information may be rather innocuous about the individual. The, the person's privacy rights is, is balanced against the competing public interest in disclosure of the information. And the interesting thing, the Supreme Court has defined the underpinnings of the FOIA is that it isn't just, public interest isn't just are you curious about something, it's so that citizens can find out what their government is up to. So it has to be some public interest. If that outweighs the competing privacy interest, then the, then the exemption won't be applied. But if the privacy interests are strong and a publicy, public interest in disclosure is weak, then the privacy interests will be protected. So there are competing interests in, in many it, areas. It, the, the, that example is exactly where I wanted to go. Thanks for, for getting Pardon us. Pardon me? I said that example is exactly where I wanted to go. Thanks for, thanks for getting us there. Can you give me an example of, of when such a competing interest may have outweighed the otherwise blanket exemption? Or a, a set of circumstances, let us say, rather than a specific example where a competing interest would have outweighed the exemption. Well, competing interest in disclosure? Yeah. Uh, generally, generally, uh, we protect privacy. I mean, we No one's suggesting you don't, but in, in an exemption that says that the privacy act shall apply, that this person's private files will, will remain with the, with the FBI or with that individual after four years of waiting to get it, if there is an occasion where that file would be reduced to paper or communicated in some way to someone else, can you give me a set of circumstances no. under which that may happen? No, it, 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 that <coughs> really won't happen. There could be a public interest. There may have been some public disclosure before. Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you an example. If if um, if if and, and these are exceptions. Generally, I'll go into the generally. Generally, won't give out information about other individuals. If the requester is Mr. A and he writes in and says, "I'd like some information about Mr. B," we write back to him and say, "We uh, will not be able to give you information about Mr. B unless either you provide us a, uh, a privacy waiver by Mr. B or proof of Mr. B's death, because the privacy d dies with with the individual." Um, so in general, we're not going to give out information about others. And that's a very interest, interesting point, and I'm glad, I'm glad we brought this up. And the FBI in processing requests really has three sets of clients or customers. One is the requester, titled, get all the information they're entitled to. Uh, second is the FBI and the American people in the country. We've got to balance things to protect 
the FBI's ability to continue to function and serve the nation and serve the people of this nation by not disclosing uh, confidential sources or not uh, revealing details of sensitive investigative techniques, and therefore you can't use them anymore. And the third set of clients we have are those individuals whose privacy we protect. People who are in the files, and they don't even know we're protecting their privacy. So, in general, uh, there wouldn't be a competing public interest. An example of it would be, for example, if you, um, if you wrote in information and then there was information about me in there. I'm, I'm in the senior executive service in the FBI, and, and people who are at this level we consider uh, a more public figures, and so you will get information about me. If it was a, 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 a line agent and investigator, we'd protect his name, for example. So in general, we're protecting privacy very, very, very strongly. Okay, so the exemptions, while, while very good broad rules, are really guidelines. I mean, in a loose way, because you will weigh in a competing interest if there is a valid one. They're not as blanket or as naked as they appear. Would that, is that a fair statement? I, I think that, um, well, in, in the first place, there are laws, and they're, they've been defined by a lot of case law mm -hmm. as to what their content uh, should be. Um, See, uh, per perhaps, perhaps maybe I, by way of explanation, I can, I can say this further. In your department, in, in, in your hands, uh, is the rulemaking authority of whether this will go out or whether it will not. And there is an appellate process, I understand that and whatnot, but that's also in your hands. So there is a great deal of trust reposed in you that it will be done right because there isn't a lot of check and balance on whether it is or it is not done. Consequently, I'm trying to find out with, without arriving at any specific examples or without trying to actually obtain information I shouldn't be having in the form of a hearing, w whether, you know, or under what circumstances your thought processes go, under what circumstances you make that decision, and under what rules or categories you say the exemption applies or it does not apply, or the exemption is exempted because of a competing interest, or the exemption is exempted because case law says it's not exempted. Or, and, and I think what we're getting at here in, 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 in all of the questioning we've heard so far is that these exemptions are, are really guidelines. And, and they're good ones, and you adhere to them very closely, but there are, there are exceptions to the exemptions that will cause information well, I, to leave your department. I guess conceptually we're talking about, the question is whether the exemption applies or not, and it's a rational decision. I think they're more than guidelines. I mean, they're laws. Um, and we have to apply them according to the law. I wasn't quite sure I heard you correctly, but I think you said the appellate process is in my hands as well. And that, that is not so. The appeals process is from an FBI uh, decision on, on freedom of information is to the Department of Justice. And those appeals are adjudicated by Department of Justice attorneys. We're, part, we're a component of the Department of Justice. I, so I assume you were wearing your larger DOJ hat. I'm sorry. Pardon me? I assume that the FBI was wearing its larger DOJ hat today, but you know. Well, no, but I mean it's a different, it's a different entity, an apparent entity, and therefore. I agree. That, that's so. And I wanted to clarify that if I, if I might, because this very same entity making appellate decisions as initial decisions is, is conceptually a bit of a problem, I think. Mm -hmm. But and we're not in that situation. But uh, we have to make judgments. For example, B7, exemption B7A has to do with law enforcement records where um, the release of them would, um, would interfere with an enforcement proceeding. It's a so-called pending case exception. You have to make judgments in, in categories of the information. This is what the courts require. You go through, the analyst goes through and makes judgments in categories of information whether those, release of those, would harm the investigation or release would harm the government's ability to get a fair trial. Sometimes it's decided, no, it wouldn't. For example, already public source information wouldn't protect that just because it's part of a pending case. You might find that other information wouldn't affect the prosecution or the investigation might give that up. So these have to be categorically done, and there's a large body of case law on each one of these things. And we really, really do our best, I think, to, to um, work within the law, make these judgments legally and rationally and in, in, in an intelligent manner. and. Uh, they're not just guidelines, but you have to have judgment. That's why analysts have to take some time and care in doing these things. Okay. I, I have two <coughs> easier questions. Uh, Pardon me? I have two easier questions. Uh, one, it, if I were to ask for my file, and I was a field artillery officer for five years. I, I handled special weapons. I know that there were background investigations done on me. I authorized them. So I know there's a file on me. 
how extensive it is, I do not know, and I guess it will take me four years to find out if I were to make the request today. When I receive that file, barring some criminal action that may happen to me in the future, and I don't expect, but assuming it doesn't, will that file come to me in any way redacted? A background investigation about you? No, your file. If I ask your, for the FBI file on me, will that come to me in any way redacted? Are there any circumstances under which you won't tell me about me what you know? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. What there, might those be? There could be. For example, uh, we would protect confidential sources. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if there it was a background investigation, do I have the facts correct? Is it yes, a background yeah, investigation right. on you? Because I was a bit distracted by a note when you started That's talking. That's okay. Uh, Been there myself. That's right. Okay. Uh, in any event, in a background investigation, if people had furnished information in confidence, uh, the law uh, would allow us to protect the identity of the people who okay, furnished that's not confidential really... information and, the, and, <coughs> and information would tend to identify them that they had furnished. That's not really information about me that you have. That's information about other people about me. No. It's, uh, it, it could uh, it be people furnishing information about you okay. in the background investigation. That, that is surplusage they, in my file. If they wanted confidence and they right. were promised confidence during a background investigation, I mean, there's a, there is a value in... Sure. Continuing to promise, because other, and I'm sure members of Congress are asked about, interviewed in background investigations Absolutely. in various contexts, and sometimes uh, people want the confidence that if they are frank and honest about the person who's a subject of the background investigation, that this will be protected. And so we will honor that. I don't think anyone would disagree. Is there any other redaction that one might see in his own file if he asks for it? No, privacy of other people. They're on a privacy basis. Is there information about other people in there? Privacy? Yes. Tremendous. One, one last question, Mr. Chairman, if I may. There, there could be other things as well, but okay. we'd have to look at it. Now, you ran through some of the, the possibilities of redaction about Mr. A asking for Mr. B and having that request approved under, under some set of perfectly legitimate exceptions. Will the FBI go to the greatest extent possible to redact Mr. A's file with Mr. B's request? to exactly what Mr. B is looking for, and how does Mr. B communicate that to you? We, uh, generally, we will not process a file about Mr. B for Mr. A. We, we, we won't I understand process. that, but, you, but you've also said today that there are circumstances where Mr. B can get Mr. A's file. And un, in those no, circumstances, uh, at those times, when Mr. B gets Mr. A's file, is it redacted as much as possible? And if so, how do you know how to redact it? Well, I think that let me clarify this. Okay. Uh, we will not process Mr. B's file for Mr. A unless Mr. B gets a privacy waiver from uh, Mr. A gets a privacy waiver from Mr. B, or he he proves to us that Mr. B has died because the privacy rights of all of us will. Well, let's will go say with let's him. say Mr. B then is one of those public officials you were talking about, and we don't have to talk about Mr. B. We'll talk about Mr. G. You know, is uh, is is it possible that Mr. G's file, when it is requested by Mr. A? How is that file redacted, if at all? And how does the FBI know how to redact it? To what extent will the FBI redact it? Is that contained in the request? I'd like to know everything there is to know about Mr. Our G's policy is to reply and ask for a privacy waiver okay. or proof of death. Okay. Now, there may be situations, like I brought up the example of me. If, if, if I was in a file, okay. there are times when an individual will be in a file. Mr. B is in a file. Mr. A is asked about a subject matter. Mm -hmm. Mr. B's name and information about Mr. B appear in the file. Then we would provide the we would we would process it and protect his privacy there. But generally, um, in fact, we don't even confirm or deny we have a file. If Mr. A asks uh, Mr. B uh, a file on Mr. B, we'll go back and we don't even confirm or deny we have such a file. We ask, you know, provide us a privacy privacy waiver. Um, our proof of death, and we don't confirm or deny that we have files. We say that we would, we we will search for a potential file after we get a privacy waiver or proof of death, but not before. Now, unless it was some very very public, it was very very public that we had a file. I mean, okay. let's say it was it, someone very very public. You had the file, and I made the request for Mr. B's file, Mr. G's file. How would you redact that file? Would it be in the parameters of my request? And if so, how do I articulate that to you? Or would it just be you'd give me the file? It, it, we, would not pr we would not process the file for you about Mr. B 
um, is very, very public. We would not, we would not process that file for you without his waiver. Okay, if he's found within another file on a subject matter, and he is a very, very public figure, maybe then we'd make the judgment on privacy. But in general, we're very strongly protecting personal privacy by not processing files on others uh, without the privacy waiver or proof of death. In fact, in a public figure, we generally would release public source material only. Material is public source. Only. So we're very strong in protecting privacy. I'll leave it to the chairman to go to the next question. I, I thank him for his indulgence in this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Well, I thank you. You've raised an interesting question, which i sort of getting to anyhow. As I understand it, uh, you mentioned, Mr. O'Brien, that you do not even admit to the inquirer that there is a file on that individual unless you have either death certificate, copy of the death certificate, or a notarized access to that file from the individual. And you do that under the Privacy Act. Is that correct? Yes. Maybe. Okay. Are Some there, proof of death. I mean, it can be other than the okay. death certificate. Uh, so my query, and I'm going to get to here on defense, and if FBI is involved, I'd like to hear about it. Let's take a wild subject for some people, but about which there's a lot of public interest. There's members of Congress. Mr. Schiff in New Mexico has had uh, extensive discussions on this, and that's unidentified flying objects. And uh, the question would be, if anybody was connected with those unidentified flying objects, where does one go to find possible documents that might exist? Let's take the Department of Defense to start with. Uh, one could assume, gee, the Air Force ought to be involved. Some of those cases, as I read the papers, go back to when it was the Army Air Force. So maybe the records are with the Army. Did the Air Force take the records? Maybe they're with the Joint Chiefs. Maybe they're with the Air Defense Command, if you're talking about radar indicators and all the rest of that. So just give me, run me through where somebody interested in that, Mr. Schiff or other members of Congress, average citizen, members of the press, where do they go? Is there a central repository they can ask and they would get an honest answer whether a file existed or not? Yes, sir. Uh all of the records that we're aware of that have been collected about UFOs have been accessioned to the National Archives and Records Administration. I know when we receive those requests, we have a little packet of information that we provide back to the requester of documents that we have in our public reading room about UFOs, and we then refer them to the National Archives and Records Administration for any other records. As far as I know, the Air Force all of the records they have collected, they have a session to the National Archives and Records Administration. How, how is the member of Congress who asked the question or the citizen or the media to know that indeed those entities of the Department of Defense, which predate the existence of the Department of Defense, that all those records have been turned over to the National Archives? How do we find that out? I would imagine you could ask the National Archives. But I'm not aware. I mean, the records are a session. I'm not a records manager. Yeah. I, I run a, a directorate for Freedom of Information and Security Review, but records are a session based on directions from the archivist of the United States into the National Archives and Records Administration. As far as I know, from 60 or, or years earlier, they've all been a session to the National Archive and Records Administration that are of a historical value to the United States. But if they weren't, do we just have to get every office head somewhere in the Department of Defense it, to it, come up here under oath and tell us whether they're there or not? In my opinion, sir, if they were not of historical value, they were probably just thrown away. Well, that's possible, too, I'm sure. But uh, how do we know? Because uh, the archivist doesn't know something's missing. No, he agree. just knows what he's got. So how do you know where the records are if somebody says, oh, well, we're not sophisticated enough to know that fact, so we keep it out on the uh, sophistication exception, which isn't in the law, but uh, that's why I got in on the need to know. Somebody makes this judgment that it's too much for us to think about, therefore they don't need to know it, so we won't send it to the archives, but we'll keep it somewhere over here someplace. If I can clarify a little bit that? about need to know. Yeah. Need to know is quite a common term within the Department of Defense, but right. it's generally between individuals of, that already have class, uh, security classification clearances. And if A has a clearance and B has a clearance and B is working on some topic or subject and A has no need to know, it's not shared with him. Right. But under the FOIA, need to know is not an issue. 
because either the information is releasable or it is not releasable. Yeah. And need to know has nothing to do with that. It has to fit the exemptions for being denied or it's released. Okay, it fits the exemptions, and if it's classified, it's uh, denied, unless the classifying office says, well, we can declassify that. Now, what I'd like to know is, are there any classifications in the Department of Defense or anywhere else in government of which you're aware besides confidential, secret, and top secret? There are, everything that I know of fits in those three categories of classification. Okay, because people uh, used to talk about the Q clearance or something in relation well, that's, to Well, that's a form, I think, sir, of, of the top level of classification of top secret. Well, are there any forms under the categories of top secret that would be a, cl a de facto classification without calling it top secret? It would, you'd have to have the top secret, then you would have to have the need to know uh, for that particular portion of that clearance. That, that's what that amounts to. Mm -hmm. And who decides We have that? code word, we have special access programs, with, which, uh, who decides that? Yeah. The people that have access to the program as to whether somebody else has a need to know about that program. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm uh, watching the Groucho Marx show. And I'm, I'm what, sorry, What's sir. the magic word down here? Uh, how does one ask an intelligent question of the Pentagon on historic documents if they don't know the subclassifications under top secret? Is that indeed also top secret, or is that public knowledge as to what are the subclassifications? I'd have to take that question for you, sir. Could you? Could you look into it? Staff will work with you. We'll file the answer for the record. Yes, sir. Uh, so let me uh, uh, go back here a minute to... Uh, a case now, Mr. O'Brien, I think you're familiar with it since you wrote me about it, knowing on the 30th anniversary I was going to have a uh, hearing on the uh, Freedom of Information Act, the Privacy Act, the whole works. I wrote the director on October 21st, 1995, just partly to see what happens, about a case of an individual that I've known for a number of years, and uh, the, these letters in exchange will be put into the record. It's dated October 21st, 1995, to the Honorable Louis J. Free, Director, Federal Bureau of Investigation. And I say, Dear Mr. Free, this request requires your personal attention and, it is hope, your approval of the Freedom of Information Act request noted below. Background. This request has been made to me by Mr. Robert Dellinger, whom I've known for over two decades. Bob Dellinger was a part-time faculty member at California State University, Long Beach, when I was president. He was an ex-convict from Terminal Island. He did outstanding work at the university as well as at Terminal Island, where, as a prisoner, he began the first course on creative writing in the federal prison system. After he was released, he voluntarily returned to teach that course for a total of 17 years. For the past 20 years, Mr. Dellinger has achieved success as a writer-producer of various TV series and movies, and also a miniseries. He was one of the key speakers, along with Judge Matt Byrne, at the Judge Manuel Real's testimony dinner, testimonial dinner when he gave up his chief judgeship to Judge Byrne. Judge Real was Bob Dellinger's sentencing judge. He took an interest in Bob and is his friend. In brief, Mr. Dellinger is not a miscreant or a misfit. Now, here's the Freedom of Information request. Bob Dellinger has told me that when he filed for his FBI materials under the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act, the Bureau was unable to locate certain key documents, including summaries of its contacts with the CIA before Dellinger was pro prosecuted. However, the CIA did find all of those materials in its files, and it released them to him, totally unexempted, with the exception of the two teletypes which the CIA says the FBI accepted. Dellinger claims the CIA also has no objection to releasing this information without exemptions if the FBI withdraws its objections. So I was testing to see what's the interagency cooperation here. In the interest of truth, I would hope that the FBI would drop its objections to the release, unexpurgated, of the two attached CIA teletypes, which I will file with the record also. They're dated February 9th and 11th, 1972, from the CIA's Los Angeles office to its headquarters, and will advise the CIA to send the full text of those materials to Mr. Robert Dellinger. I'm informed that special agents who stepped over the line in this case were ordered to do so, and then I name that particular agent, which I won't name here, uh, who became the first and only special agent in charge to be denied membership in the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI. 
Uh, Mr. Dellinger has assured me that he intends to show in his movie about this matter that it was not an institutional policy of the FBI that caused the agent's misdeeds, but rather that the misdeeds were the result of the individual agent's consistent breach of many policies. For example, that agent claims Dellinger had used his badge to obtain and then not repay almost 200000 in unsecured loans from the Beverly Hills Bank of an individual also not named whose kidnapped son was rescued by the FBI. Anything you can do to release these two records, any others pertain to Mr. Dellinger would be appreciated, so forth. And then those are attached. Now, then I received the letter from you, which I will also put in the record, uh, that uh, uh, dated January 17, 1996. I think I finally received it in uh, uh, March or so, and the letter was presumably sent, but our office had no record of its receipt. So this is what was sent, uh, a copy, after we asked for the record uh, of that letter. And you say, Dear Congressman Horn, your letter dated October 21st, 1995, concerning the Freedom of Information Privacy Act's request of your constituent, Mr. Robert Dellinger, has been referred to me for response. We have opened a new Freedom of Information, uh, well, you call it FOIPA, request for your constituent and assigned it request number 404,100 which we ask him to use in any future correspondence with us in this regard in order to be fair to our thousands of requesters awaiting an initial review of documents we are treating requests for re-review as new requests to be handled in turn therefore mr dellinger's request has been placed in our backlog of unassigned requests to await its turn for processing based on the date of receipt october 26 1995 unfortunately due to our limited resources and thousands of requests on hand I'm unable to give you a definite date of when this request will be assigned. At the end of November 1995, our total request numbered over 15,300 with over 5.4 million estimated pages to review. We assign our requests for processing based on the date of receipt consistent with sound administrative practices. We are currently assigning cases we received in April 1992. Therefore, your constituent can expect an extensive delay in assignment. In order to equitably administer the thousands of FOIPA requests, the FBI receives, we maintain a two-tiered system for assigning requests based on volume and complexity. Since there are only two documents responsive to Mr. Dellinger's request, we have placed his request in our Track 1 queue, consisting of the less voluminous and less complex request. Therefore, I anticipate his request will come up for assignment sooner than the more voluminous and complex requests in Track 2. I would like nothing more than to be able to respond to your inquiry in a more favorable manner. However, in recent years, the FBI has experienced a general increase in the level of new FOIPA requests. At the same time, we have not had sufficient resources to address this increase or the backlog of work on hand. Repeated efforts by the FBI to obtain additional resources through the annual budget process have not been successful. The FOIPA section has also been obligated to comply with court deadlines and the other legislation requiring the expenditure of a large number of resources on a limited number of requests. With government downsizing, we recently lost employees through early retirements and buyouts. This has further ex exasperated an already serious backlog situation causing additional delays in the assignment of work. I regret the delays we are experiencing and hope your constituent will be understanding and patient while waiting for his request to be handled in turn. Rest assured it will be processed in due course. If I can be of any further assistance to you, please do not hesitate. J. Kevin O'Brien, Chief, Freedom of Information, Privacy Act Section, Information Resources Division. Well, obviously, one of my concerns is, have you made the requests for additional resources? And if so, what has been the nature of those requests? Uh, do you want to double the staff to get it down to two years, or would that get you down to two years? We have, um, we have the Bureau uh, was concerned that the backlog of requests might grow going back uh, into the 80s. And in the 1987, fiscal year 1987 budget submission made its first request for more people. Uh, thereafter, we have made requests every year. Uh, the backlog of requests has grown from around 7,000 at the end of 87 uh, to what it is today, 15,200. And uh, during that time, we've been making requests for additional people. The number of additional people requests keep going up because, in fact, the requests never did make it to the Congress. Um, in many years, uh, OMB uh, 
uh, there's an approval process through right. the administration. Right, and I was going to ask you that, so I'm glad you're into it. Yeah. Many in years. In other words, you ask the uh, where who decides the budget within the FBI? Is it an assistant director for budget or administration or well, the what? Director, director, director the director approves the budget submission. So he approved your submission in '87. I take it. The, we had a submission in '87 that was sent yeah. out of the FBI. Yeah, to the attorney general or whoever represents her on the budget. Right. So what I just like is a feel for it. Has the director asked for resources each year? For yes. this office? Yes. Okay. Yes. And where has, has the Attorney General, regardless of who's Attorney General, regardless of administration, passed that on as a justice request to OMB? Uh, in most instances, yes, and, and it went to OMB. In, um, I think, the fiscal year 90, what are we, 97 now, 95 and 96, perhaps. Uh, was not passed on from the Justice Department. There were two years it wasn't passed on from the Justice Department. And those are this year, years. however, yeah. uh, where we are now with the fiscal year 97 budget request, it was approved by Justice Department, it was approved by OMB, and it is pending action here on the Hill for 129 additional people. Okay. And what would that do to getting at your backload? What's your estimate of what the 129 would do? Well, we think that that would, would begin, we would start reducing the backlog of requests. We project it out. I have not got the projections available how much that reduced, but it's in the budget. It, it is in the budget submission. And to try to get it down to a, uh, a reasonable level would be more acceptable turnaround time and be able to service more requesters. 129 people is what we're asking for in the fiscal year 1990. Seven budget. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll ask Mr. George to uh, work with your staff to see if we can get a little chart in the record at this point of when the F, uh, when your particular uh, uh, Freedom of Information Privacy Act section has asked for the funds when the director's concurred, and you're telling me he's concurred in all cases. And then the question is, did Justice Attorney General or the agent of the Attorney General approve that, and then did OMB approve it? And you're saying it's really been in the last couple of years where OMB did not approve it, I take it, if I no, listen to I you think, right. No, uh, I think within the last couple of years. But this year they did approve it. Yes. And it is going to, and it is here it in is here. the justice budget. So we need to trail it right up to the appropriations uh, subcommittee that's relevant, which I assume is the one on justice. Yes. And uh, so we'll put that in the record without objection at this point. Now getting back to the Dillinger correspondence. Uh, do you often have requests where it involves another agency? In this case, it involves the CIA, uh, where they say, we don't have a problem releasing it. I'm just interested in how this works and how you deal with that. And are there cases where other agencies refuse to release a part of what is also in your file, and therefore you can't send that out, presumably, to the requester? The uh the procedure is this, the concept of the third agency rule. If an agency has information in its records that belongs to another agency, they defer it and refer it to the agency whose information it is. In the case of Mr. Dullinger's request, while there are two CIA documents, the information in the documents is FBI information. That is information mm -hmm. that the FBI furnished to him. This is what I'm told. And therefore, the de decision as to whether that would be released would be to be made by the FBI. Mm. Even, even though CIA says they have no problem releasing it. Well, they, they might have no problem from their standpoint, mm. and we'd have to make an assessment mm. whether from our standpoint the information that's in their document that came from the FBI is such that we should release it or not. Mm. So that would go to what? The field office that handled the case would make that judgment, or is there another place in the FBI where that no, judgment's we, made? No, we would make that judgment here in the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't even have to refer it. You just have sort of operating rules that decide which information you release and which you don't? Is that it? You just built up over the years ways to handle certain cases? Based upon the based upon the exemptions that are available in the statute, yes, mm -hmm. and we don't we that's right. The processing well, most of our processing is done centrally at the FOIA section in, in FBI headquarters, mm -hmm. as opposed to I think Defense said that a lot of their processing is done mm -hmm. in various installations. What what exemption would be used in this case? I assume you've had a chance to look at it now. Uh, that I, it's part of a hearing process. 
have not looked at the actual documents, but I'm told that the, uh, the question is of a confidential source, that it's not a classified, I was told it's not classified, a classified information issue, but a confidential source issue. Now, could a confidential source also be an FBI agent? Or is no. a confidential source defined as someone outside the FBI? That's right, and it may be a, pri there may be a privacy uh, issue there if there's somebody, uh, an agent in the FBI, maybe. Mm -hmm. We'd have to look at it. And as I mentioned, without mentioning names, although it's in a, it'll be in a right. public document, right. uh, you have here an agent that apparently is questionable by the FBI and its standards of ethics and conduct that apparently is involved in this case. I'm not familiar with the details of it, but uh, it just seemed to me that uh, somebody needs to take a good look at this case and see if, if they're trying to protect that individual, should that individual really be protected. I don't, uh, right, we we'll certainly look at that. I don't think we'll try to protect the individual. There is really, there is, go ahead. Uh, there is case law on the uh, the issue of protecting uh, uh, persons who are officials in the government. There's a case, the Stern case, mm -hmm. which drew a line on uh, very high-level people get less privacy protection mm -hmm. than those in the middle middle or lower ranks would. And uh, we will follow whatever the applicable law is and apply okay. it. Well, says, can we have a response on this for the record that we can put in that resolves this matter? Uh, what would the, exactly well, I, I, what I, I'd like question? To, well, I'd, I'd like a response to this letter that we can put into the hearing record that resolves this case with the FBI, uh, because I'm interested, one, in interagency cooperation, and number two, since uh, an agent that apparently did not... Uh, when the approval of the FBI is involved in this case, if that's anywhere in those redacted documents, because I, I don't have the slightest idea what was redacted, neither does the individual involved by that document. Well, I don't, I don't either. I, I, what I'm working on the, is the, uh, uh, the version of the facts which Mr. Dulliger has provided you, and mm -hmm. whether, you know, yeah, and whether he's accurate wrong, or not, I don't know. Sure, and, and if that's wrong, I'd like to have a statement uh, from the FBI that we can close out the record and put it in this hearing record. All right, could we, we, can we follow up with staff as to exactly what you're Yeah, I, I just want a response on this decision, and I want, if there's a problem with the request or if I've stated the facts wrong, I'd be the first to like to know it, and I'd like oh, to yeah. put your version in the record along with this version that's going in the record. What has happened with the request at this time is it's been put in, put in a queue. In other words, mm -hmm. no... It is not up for analysis yet. It's in that shorter track well, queue. Well, I, I would think when a congressional hearing right. uses it as a case that the FBI would then get that to the top of the queue. Right. We, will, we will be back to you on this case. Good. Well, right. well, we'll need it within two weeks to close out the hearing record. Sure. Uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Flanagan, has some questions. I have just two, and uh, one, one is simple, and I think one is clarifying. Mr. O'Brien, if... Uh, if uh, an individual requests information about himself and requests it of the FBI and wants to see his file, and you would otherwise redact it be to protect the source of that information under that source's privacy requirements, and that's all well and fine. To what extent would that redaction happen? To, to the extent to the name of the source or to any information that that source provided, would that be redacted as well, or would there be some compromise in between? It depends on the nature of the case. Okay. Um, in order to protect the ad identity of a source, you have to redact the name and identifying data, and as well any information that would tend to identify it. Okay. Okay. And uh, th that would have to be done to protect them because uh, facts as to what somebody told may very well indicate right. who it is, even if you protect his name. So we'd have, to, we'd have to do that. So that's a, a judgment process on your part as to what that might be. Still well, trying to give as much information as possible. In the criminal cases, in the criminal cases, we're allowed by law, uh, by the second clause of a B7D exemption, to once it has been determined that a person is a confidential source, 
we are allowed by the law to exempt all the information furnished without making an analysis of uh, whether or not particular bits of information would tend to identify them. On Attorney General Reno's discretionary release policy, however, we do make that analysis and we will, will release some information uh, that the information that would not tend to identify them. Uh, so it varies from case to case and of course if a person requests files about themselves, those kinds of files can be different depending on the individual. It could be a background investigation if a person has uh, been involved in government service it could be uh, criminal cases. For example, if an organized crime figure made a request, I'd like to see the file or files you have on me, it could be you know, criminal investigations. And therefore, they'd be confidential sources in there, and, and we'd protect them. So these things can be different. Good. Hey, it's, uh, and I'm glad to see that the stated policy is to provide as much as possible while still protecting the exemption, which is for a very good reason. Uh, and I, I think I can clarify where the chairman was trying to be with, uh, with his questions. I think what he was asking about, if, if I understand uh, the chairman, uh, was are there administrative levels where DOD would be unwilling to provide information apart from the official categories of confidential, secret, top secret, and then the various classifications of access and top secret. So let's say, for example, the document was marked FOUO. Under what uh, strictures would that be withheld, if at all, or any other administrative marking outside of, uh, outside of the official classifications for national security or other reasons it may be marked? I think we get kind of lost in the discussion and need to know, because there aren't many documents stamped need to know that's, that's understood under other matters. But if it is stamped FOUO for, for official use only, which is a common administrative barrier to access within DOD, is that a barrier to a FOIA request? It's not a barrier to a FOIA request, but some of the information which is FOUO may be denied from the FOIA exemption of B4, i.e. privileged or confidential trade secrets or commercial or financial information, which is why that document would have been marked FOU. Under, under the other and ordinary exemptions? Yes, sir. Are there any other administrative classifications other than FOUO that, that may require some attention? I, I do not know of any other, sir. I thank you. I thank the chairman. <laughs> thank my colleague, the vice chairman. You can tell when you're fully Irish, you finish the question when we poor half Irish just can't quite get to it. So I thank the gentleman very much. And uh, I see our distinguished chairman of the full committee. I should say to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, we have mentioned the irony of the 339 files being delivered by the FBI to the White House when you don't even have a signature on the letter. And uh, we have a little problem here with citizens getting their files when it takes a four-year queue, not to mention members of Congress who are in court cases getting their files. So if the chairman would like to give us an indication of what he plans next week, we'd be glad to hear it before we recess till 1.30. Uh, well, I just would uh, basically want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing because we're dealing here with, with the statutes uh, that are very sensitive, very necessary. They're the sort of statutes that uh, do uh, provide a, a right of the public to know, but at the same time hopefully ensure that individual rights are not being trampled on, that there's a, there's a fine line between uh, involving those decisions. And obviously, I think the, uh, the immediacy of what has been going on lately, it's very appropriate that we're holding this hearing uh, today. I do intend to go into this in more detail on the specific uh, situation involving the, uh, uh, the files that were turned over. And, and I think we clearly have a lot of questions about procedures that are involved here because I think the, the issue really is have we in the zeal to have the public's right to know at the same time we have gone overboard in, in, uh, in perhaps invading uh, uh, the individual's right to privacy. So uh, we will explore that uh, next week and first of uh, I think will be three hearings on this matter but this is important for the future and for ensuring that these uh, statutes are doing what they were designed to do and no more. 
I, I suggested before you came in the room that I'm um, thinking after I listened to all this testimony, and you and I have gone through some of the, what you're going to bring out, of putting a bill in that says when the president, when the White House wants some files, say you're going to consider someone for the Supreme Court, the president ought to sign his name on the dotted line when you make that request. And there ought to be some understanding that they, the files don't sit over there forever, unless they're Xeroxes of the files or something. But it just seems to me that uh, when they respond to a sort of typewritten name there with no signature, you don't know if Mickey Mouse did it or the intern. The name, the use of the yeah. name was apparently not uh, known to the, to the person who gave it. Uh, right. His name was used and did not give authorization to anybody to do that. So I think there are questions. But yeah. uh, I do hope that, as I understand, Director Free has indicated to me that uh, they hope to have a conclude their at least initial investigation of what happened uh, by tomorrow, and we'll look forward to having that report. Oh, well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we are in recess till 1.30 when we have a number of key panels uh, coming in of uh, journalists and others who have been intimately involved with the Freedom of uh, Information Act and privacy requests, and we will also get into some of the policy areas with GSA and the uh, director of the uh, uh, committee Management uh, Secretariat for General Services Administration, as well as some distinguished lawyers who have dealt with this subject over the year. We thank you both for coming. Uh, sorry to take so long, uh, but uh, we, you, you have some valuable information to share with us, and we appreciate it. And uh, I might say on the Defense Department also, we'd like staff to work out the same as we're working out for justice, that if you need more staffing over there, have you asked for it? Has the Secretary of Defense or the Controller sent that forward to OMB? Have they sent it forward to the Congress? What happened to it? In other words, we're trying to solve these questions so it isn't just the spirit of the act that's carried out, but the actual implementation. Because there won't be much spirit left if we all sit around waiting four years, six months, whatever it is. And I realize you have a problem. And, but that's the reason the law was passed, so people could find out what's going on in government. And we need to back, a, back you up with the resources to get that job done. So thank you for coming. We're in recess till 1.30. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellent hearing. Just begin in the order in which they are in the agenda. And we'll start with Ms. Wilson of the Society of Professionals. American Society of Newspaper Editors, Newspaper Association of America. Ms. Wilson. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the Honorable Chairman Stephen Horn and members of the subcommittee for inviting me here today to speak to you about my experience using the Freedom of Information Act. I know that you have my written statement, so I'll just try to touch some of the high points of it, and then if you have any questions, I'll feel free to ask. Um, I know that as uh, makers of the law, oftentimes you don't get out and see the people that use the Freedom of Information Act and, the, and use the information that is available in this country. So I would like to share with you some of my experiences. I've been to the National Archives in College Park. I've been to reading rooms in Hanford, Oak Ridge, um, uh, Germantown, Maryland. I guess I've seen so many documents, I'm, I, I'm going to need glasses in the near future. But this story for me was very touching and I'd like to uh, talk to you about that. Two years ago I was looking at some old Atomic Energy Commission records at the National Archives in P College Park. It was a Saturday, I think, and the reading room was nearly empty. Across from me, a man with reddish hair was reading some documents. He appeared to be in a state of great excitation. He would sigh occasionally and then jot down some notes with one of the yellow pencils the archivist gave us. My curiosity was aroused. During a lunch break, I ran into him in the cafeteria. He was from Virginia, as I recall, and he was on vacation. I asked him what he was researching. The Kennedy assassination, he responded. There were some things about the case that didn't add up, he implied. Uh, inferring that he had made some new discoveries. I thought he was a dreamer as I punched the button to the elevator that would take me back upstairs to the research room. But then it came to me what I had witnessed. 
the free and open access Americans have to documents about one of the most important events of the 20th century. Anybody can literally hold that history in their hands. You don't have to be a scholar, lawyer, or journalist to look at the Kennedy records. They're there for everybody to read and ponder. And as one of the men this morning was speaking about the Kennedy records, I believe he was from the FBI, I, th I thought of this man. I thought, well, if you know, people are out there using this information, and it's a wonderful thing to see and to, to know that this is available in our country. And I just want to tell you that, in my opinion, the Freedom of Information Act speaks to the same principles of open government. And I see it as a tool for the little guy, for journalists, like myself, for public interest groups, and for other taxpayers. Very briefly, um, I want to just tell you my experience using the FOIA in the past, my experience using the FOIA today, and why I think that this uh, Electronic Freedom of Information Act is just a terrific law. And, and I, f I feel very strongly, and I'm sure other journalists do, that, that, that this will improve our country and our access to democracy. Um, several years ago, when I was working for the Albuquerque Tribune, I filed a FOIA seeking information on 18 people who were injected with plutonium during the Manhattan Project. I got back a few boilerplate contracts and a couple of documents that would fit in an envelope. And then I proceeded to get, a, get the runaround. And some, at some point during that process, I drew a line in the sand. You know, it was like, you know, we have to do a lot of things as reporters and take a lot of insults and work long hours as everybody else does. But I just thought, you know, these are 50 years, 50 year old records. These people are dead. These are not nuclear secrets. And I just felt my newspaper was entitled to them. That began the fight. Um, it continued for several years. In August of 92, we had to enlist the aid of the Baker Hostetler firm. Um, we, don't, we do not use attorneys frequently, and this was a very exceptional case. I cannot tell you why we decided to do it. Uh, most of them we have to push on our own time. Um, the Baker Hostetler firm then began pressing the DOE for documents, and they started to trickle in. Eventually, we had enough information to put a series together. It was a three-day series, and uh, it prompted tremendous response in the national media and in the international media. Uh, to just give you an example of that response, it, it was so overwhelming that the paper could barely get the paper out. We ran out of fax paper, we ran out of FedEx envelopes, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really an extraordinary event. Um, as a result of, of our series, uh, a number of things happened in the government. Many records were made public. Um, many of those records have since been put on the internet. I understand that some of them are being digitalized and will go on the internet in the near future. And um, so things have changed dramatically since 1993. Um, I've used the FOIA on seven occasions or so since that time. I've had very good luck. The DOE in particular seems to bear no resemblance to the agency I had been dealing with before. Uh, I feel that this Electronic Freedom of Information Act would make law many of the things that the agencies are doing already, as I, as I heard this morning and as I have experienced uh, in my own information requests. So I guess in conclusion, I would like to say that I I know that, that people change, that, that bureaucracies change, um, and that if, this, if these changes were made law, then reporters such as myself and taxpayers would not be at the mercy of a FOIA officer or would not be at the mercy of an institution that we didn't understand. You know, the law would be there, we would all know the ground rules, and we could use it. 
And I also would like to say that I think that, and I don't think it's any surprise to y'all, but with the computer, with, with, with so much, so many people using computers today, I think that to be able to get your information on a disk in the long run would be cheaper. And let me just say that, for example, in the case of the plutonium records I got, it was something on the neighborhood of five, maybe ten boxes that had to be copied and mailed out. And all that would have fit on a disk that would have gone in a 32 cent envelope. And so with that, I guess I'll end. And I, I really, really appreciate your time and your interest in this bill. Thank you. Well, we thank you. Uh, your story is a good one, as you would expect of a fine reporter. And thank you. Uh, you speak for millions of people that have had your experience and my experience. And if you sat through the uh, session this morning, you know that members of Congress don't get treated any differently than anybody else. Well, They'll let us sit four years, what, too. What, what, what was so pleasing to me, and pleasing may be the wrong word, was to see that. You know, I thought, my God, we're not the only ones that that happens to. I, I didn't feel quite so lonely. We're going to start the, the equivalent of an Alcoholics Anonymous Club for right, denial right. of documents club, I think. And right. we can all moan to each other. But right. thank you for that testimony. Thank I know you. I know you have to catch a plane. If you could stay through some of the testimony, we'd appreciate it. But I would, I, you're going out of national, I take it. Yes, thank you very yeah, much. Good. But leave when you feel you have to. Uh, Mr. Larry Clayman is chairman of Judicial Watch Incorporated, and uh, that has quite a reputation, so we're glad to have you here. Very much appreciate the opportunity. Uh, as you know, my name is Larry Clayman, and I'm chairman of Judicial Watch. I've had an experience with the federal government going back 19 years as a trial lawyer, prosecutor with the Department of Justice, uh, later uh, in private practice, and now running public interest group by the name of Judicial Watch, which is a nonpartisan ethics and legal watchdog group. I'm very happy to hear that Ms. Wilson has had a positive experience in some respects, and certainly that's a good thing. I think when the government uh, is engaged in releasing information, that is important, not just for public interest groups, but for the press and for private citizens. However, there is a problem, and although I sat here and listened carefully to some very distinguished gentlemen from the Department of Justice, uh, from the FBI, which is part of the Department of Justice, and other branches of government, I'm not quite as optimistic as they are that the Freedom of Information Act and Federal Advisory Committee Act and the other open government acts are being administered in a way which truly allows for a free flow of information, particularly when politically sensitive issues are involved. And here brings us to the nub of the question. And perhaps I feel a little bit more like Rodney Dangerfield than Larry Clayman. Uh, perhaps we don't get the respect uh, that we should, not just Judicial Watch, but other groups who seek access to confidential, sensitive information. We had an experience with the Department of Commerce where our group looked into these foreign trade missions that then Secretary Brown was conducting, now Secretary Cantor. It had been widely publicized that these trips were being used as a way to, in effect, sell seats to high contributors to the Democratic Party. And we wanted to see how that was happening, to be able to explain to the American people and perhaps to Congress and others that this was not the correct way to use government resources. We filed a Freedom of Information Act. We received no response. I made inquiries with the department, spoke with the FOIA officer, who was a very fine person, and she told me, told me candidly, there's nothing I can do about it. This matter is being handled by the Secretary's office himself. Didn't receive any response beyond that point. Uh, spoke with a Melissa Moss, who was the fundraiser of the Democratic Party in 1992 in the presidential campaign, working with Secretary Brown, and made no headway there. The moral to the story is, is that eventually, Judicial Watch had to file suit. And when we brought suit, fortunately, it was assigned to a judge, Judge Lamberth of the U.S. District Court in D.C., who is very strong on open government laws and who put his foot down and required the Department of Commerce to produce 30,000 documents free of charge. They tried to uh, charge Judicial Watch $13,000, hoping that we couldn't afford uh, to pay that before they came up with the documents. 
And lo and behold, as we expected, those documents showed that, in fact, political influence was the modus operandi for choosing participants on this trip, not merit. With no lack of respect to the Department of Commerce, before which I practice in a private capacity, nor any other branch of government, candidly, there's a serious problem that when a political issue is involved, and this is particularly true in the Clinton administration, which the justice people could attest to, promised open government, promised not to claim those exemptions unless absolutely necessary. There has been a tendency to withhold information, not just to Judicial Watch, but to this committee, uh, to other branches of government. It has not functioned, this openness, the way President Clinton had touted it. To give you an example of why these things occur, and this is human nature, this request at the Commerce Department, having been handled primarily by the inner office of the Secretary, we believe was in fact run, responding to the request, by officials in that office. When I deposed, because Judge Lamberth allowed for a deposition to take place of several inner office people, the individual who was primarily responsible, Mr. Anthony Das, he admitted to me that he had never even seen three of the FOIA requests. And this is the person who signed an affidavit saying that, in fact, a full response was forthcoming. Other individuals testified that they were producing all documents showing how the search was made, that depositions showed that that was not correct. We have gone back in front of the court and asked the court to look into this matter. After that point in time, uh, Judicial Watch received a memorandum written by Nolanda Hill to Ron Brown, and I'll be brief because I know my time is no, go, about up. Go ahead. And in this memorandum, uh, which is written by Nolanda Hill to Ron Brown, she's complaining. She's saying, I've spoken with your staff assistants, uh, Mr. Jim Hackney. I don't know whether the document's authentic or not, but it's a document I felt had to be brought in front of the committee for investigation. And she's saying, I understand that you, Ron Brown, uh, Jim Hackney, uh, and the cut letter is copied on Rob Stein, who was his chief of staff in that inner office, are trying to silence, in effect, Jerry Knight, a reporter of the Washington Post, because he broke the story about First International, the scandal involving the Landa Hills firm. This points out a problem. This conscious effort to withhold information extends not just to FOIA, but to other aspects of the way government agencies do business, if this memorandum is true, and we don't know, that needs to be, I think, investigated, then it would mean that individuals working in the inner office of Secretary Brown were in fact working on his private matters, things which he claimed involved uh, nothing to do with the Commerce Department, that first international scandal. That's not a proper use of government resource. All of this taken as a whole points out why openness in government is really in the eyes of the beholder is that when there is an important sensitive issue and when these agencies perceive a threat to the individual who appointed many of their officials, they will not play by the rules. They will force public interest groups and individuals to file suit. They will withhold documents. They will sign declarations which arguably are not true and this needs to be investigated. They will take other actions to prevent the access to government that all Americans deserve. It is very important for this committee, in the view of Judicial Watch, to consider three possible changes to the Freedom of Information Act. First, there should be criminal penalties for the willful withholding of information under that Freedom of Information Act. Secondly, the award of attorney's fees by courts, and it's bad enough that you have to bring a case, but frequently judges will not award attorney's fees and costs because it's a discretionary act. And in fact, that is a huge bar barrier to bringing these cases. We know that many news organizations wanted to look into the Commerce Department's activities, but for whatever reason, they did not want to bring suit because it's cumbersome and it's costly. And then finally, we welcome the oversight activities of committees such as your own, who can certainly, by bringing out a free flow discussion, not candy coated, but dealing with the reality of what Washington is all about how things really happen here, can help uh, create a situation where government officials will be more responsive. And with regard to the Commerce Department, uh, Judicial Watch has been active in many other areas as well. 
Uh, we have an ongoing export promotion program being carried out by Secretary Cantor. I think it's important for Judicial Watch to continue to pursue its FOIA requests because we believe that government resources are not being properly used and we want full disclosure. Thank you. Well, we thank you. Uh, this is a good example of a case study that might occur in any administration. Uh, with your testimony, you have Exhibit 1, the Chicago Sun-Times piece that's titled The President's Price List, and that it will be put in the record without objection. Uh, now, I also have in front of me the memorandum to which you referred uh, from Nolanda Hill. Uh, is there a problem if I read this into the record? No, Your Honor. We would ask it be made as Exhibit 2 to the record. Okay. It will be included as an exhibit, but I just want to get straight who's who. Uh, it's on the paper of Nolanda Hill, 2401 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest Department 604. Now, explain again Ms. Hill's reference to this. Ms. Hill is uh, writing to Ron Brown. Right. Stating Second. that she has spoken with Jim Hackney, who was the counsel to Mr. Brown at the Commerce Department urging him not to silence Jerry Knight, a reporter of the Washington Post, who in fact broke the story about this first international scandal. Well, I take it Ms. Hill is a member of the Commerce Department staff. No, she is actually uh, an investor uh, who was the one who allegedly had given $500,000 to Secretary Brown for a venture that he was alleged to have taken no part in. This was a communications company, mm -hmm. and she was a friend. There's been a lot of recent press about her in the last few weeks, particularly in the Washington Times. And, and this uh, memorandum came t to you through a Freedom of Information request? No, it came through an alternative source. It was not produced okay. by the Commerce Department. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think if they read it that they would have produced it. but uh, Not likely. Not likely. Mr. Chairman. So as, uh, go ahead if you want to read from the this, middle portion what this, she says. This is the type of document. Would you like me to read it into you the Please record? do. It states, in my two conversations with Jim Hackney today, I have become concerned that you understand what I believe you and I agreed to concerning First International last night. I am not going to delineate the discussions concerning the business arrangement in this memorandum. However, we clearly agreed that dealing with public announcements would be done only after consensus as to form and substance has been reached between the two of us. It was my belief that no consensus had yet been reached, that forum for delivery had not been agreed to, and that we would reach a consensus following my deliberations as to your suggestions. I am now told by Hackney, that is the counsel to Secretary Brown, that the machine for, quote, getting night off your back, unquote, has been put into motion. I trust that this information is incorrect. I explained to you my position listened thoughtfully to yours, and trusted that you would not act unilaterally. Please notify me of my Washington, on my Washington answering machine, paren, you have my number, close paren, as to whether my understanding as to your position and trust in your commitment to honor my position is well placed. Again, I have been led to believe by your staff person that action is imminent on your part. If I am incorrect, Please let me know so I do not act in a hasty and possibly irrational manner which I might believe would protect me from unnecessary publicity and or irreparable damage. I am more than confident that we had an understanding as to my needs for deliberation time as to how this might be handled vis-a-vis -vis your suggestion last night. I hope I was not wrong and that this is, as indicated, as yeah, earlier, as indicated, earlier indicated, indicated, merely a communications problem. The letter according to this Exhibit 2, was copied on Rob Stein, Chief of Staff, to then Secretary Brown and Jim Hackney, his counsel. And in our view, it points out a number of things, as I said, points out that uh, the Commerce Department, according to this memorandum, uh, its officials were working to silence a reporter of the Washington Post. According to this memorandum, we're working uh, in fact, on matters that had nothing to do with the Commerce Department. And although this does not technically relate to FOIA, it, it, it relates to human nature, it relates to the reality of Washington, it relates to why we need greater sanctions if FOIA is not uh, followed. And I listened uh, to the FBI talk about the McDade case. I have a case that's very similar at Judicial Watch. 
uh, where an individual was wiretapped by the Cleveland Police Department. Uh, his name was smeared uh, throughout Cleveland. He wanted to build low-income housing, uh, providing opportunity for minorities, and apparently someone didn't like it. Uh, he was not given the documents he requested under FOIA. They told him, wait three years. He came to Judicial Watch. We filed an action on his behalf, uh, litigated it at a fraction of what it would cost uh, for anyone else to do it on their own. The FBI later admitted that, in fact, there was a wiretapping. It had told him there was no wiretapping. But the documents showed up. There was a wiretapping. He wants the names of who wiretapped him. The, I, the FBI has been dancing around in court trying to justify why he's not entitled to know who wiretapped him and who smeared his name. That's an inappropriate use of FOIA. Uh, the individual's name is John Nix. He would be available to talk with the committee. Uh, his reputation has been ruined in Cleveland. Fortunately, uh, we got Judge Charles Ritchie, another, I think, fine jurist over in the district court, uh, who, re who forced a release within a few months of the information. But we must have spent if we had been billing over $50,000 in our time. And, and that's just not the way average people should be treated. Yeah. Well, thank heaven for the Article Three judiciary, but as you suggest, they shouldn't have to go that far. But if they do, you give me another point in the bill I mentioned earlier, that if the White House is going to get confidential files out of the FBI, the President ought to sign his name to the paper. Maybe they would think twice then in terms of what they ordered, since it makes no sense what they ordered in the case we have coming up next week before Mr. Klinger's full committee. And I would think that we ought to get in some language on attorney's fees, and they ought to come out of the agency's existing budget, which would be a little bit of discipline. They couldn't just kick it up to Congress to say, you pay the bill. It would come out of their existing budget, and eventually, when the chief operating officer of an agency sees that happening, they start to get a little motivated to do something about it and clean up the process. So a few good lawsuits doing that uh, would, uh, I suspect, get some executive action where there's inaction. So we will welcome your ideas on that, and staff will be working with you on that. Uh, Mrs. Kirtley, uh, Executive Director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press regarding electronic freedom of information. Uh, we thank you for coming. Your group has a very good reputation also for getting action, sometimes I suspect with as much delay as we've described here this morning, but you're persistent. So we are that. Please, proceed. please <laughs> Thank proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are persistent, uh, often in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. Um, our organization is almost as old as the Freedom of Information Act. It was founded in 1970, and one of our primary occupations is to provide a free hotline for reporters who face legal obstacles in gathering the news. Um, the vast majority of the calls that we handle, and we handle about 2,000 a year, concern problems with access to government records and to government meetings. So um, we have at least the uh, advantage, I suppose, of a wide constituency from all over the country, and I would even add all over the world journalists who turn to us for assistance in that regard. Um, one of our uh, uh, services that we provide are a number of publications, including one on how to use the Federal FOI Act, which is now in its seventh edition that, that makes its way around the country and, and around the world. Um, I would say that when the current administration came into office, we were extremely optimistic about the probabilities of, of some significant changes in information policy. And there is certainly no question that there have been uh, some major good faith efforts uh, made by this administration to curtail government secrecy. You heard this morning about the October 1993 memorandum from uh, pre the President and the Attorney General directing agencies to have better processing procedures. Um, you also, uh, I think, are aware that in April of 1995, the President issued a new and, in our view, very overdue uh, order on classification, which I think is significant in light of the comments you heard earlier this morning from DOD and FBI about the great burden they have of sifting through previously classified documents. I think if the spirit of this order is carried out, it can make a real difference uh, in the future, certainly, but even with older records and, and may simplify the process for everybody concerned. 
Having said all these positive things, though, I have to also say that we have not achieved the kind of open government that I think uh, Congress had in mind 30 years ago uh, when it enacted FOI, and for that matter, 20 years ago when it enacted the Government in the Sunshine Act. Um, I'm not really here to talk about the Sunshine Act today, but I, I do want to point out that some of the agencies that are subject to this act are the primary lobbyists to try to change the law um, so that they can meet in secret. And I, I hope that this committee will keep that in mind when you hear their testimony later on in the process. Um, there's an entrenched bureaucracy, I think, um, in place in the federal government. Uh, it's been there for, for well on to 15 years now. Um, that makes it difficult to change some of the sort of standard operating procedures that have held up uh, the release of information. The thing that we're particularly focusing on today um, is the failure of the agencies to make records available um, in using the new technology that is now available to them. I will add that the states are way ahead of, of the federal government on most of these issues. I don't know precisely why that is. It may be that they uh, have less, less institutional inertia. It may be that there's a greater sense of accountability with the people that are living right there in the state and, and basically looking over their shoulders. Um, and I'm not suggesting that all state policies are ones that the federal government would necessarily want to replicate. But Many, many states now have in place affirmative legislation that makes clear that electronic records are public records that are subject to disclosure on the same terms that the paper documents would be. And I think that that is what is needed uh, on the federal side, and it's, it's something that I, I hope this committee will continue to work towards. Um, my formal testimony includes some examples of, of uh, egregious situations that reporters have brought to us where they've been, for example, denied access to a log of FOI requests at HHS that they were allowed to see when they were in paper form but are not allowed to see now because they're in electronic form. Uh, we've been told that some agencies won't search a database because that's creating a record which the law does not require them to do. Um, they charge their costs based on the per paper item costs that uh, came about back in the days when everything was on paper. Um, it makes no sense now when you're giving people a disc or a tape, and yet they will, they will still charge the per item cost. Um, in our view, it's a commonsensical notion that electronic records should be and can be more readily available um, at all levels of the government than paper records could be. For example, uh, you heard from the FBI earlier today about the laborious process of redacting paper records. Through the simple expedient of adopting software that would make it possible to key in the information initially so that it could be electronically redacted, they would save themselves and the requesters a great deal of time. And that is something that, again, I, I think this committee and Congress as a whole should certainly encourage agencies to consider as they're setting up their computer systems. Um, there are so many of these questions uh, that are really creating unnecessary roadblocks to the release of a lot of valuable information of great significance to the public, and we have included in our formal testimony a number of examples from newspapers, not the Washington Post, but papers like the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, the Syracuse Post, where journalists have done computer analysis of, of uh, federal government records to report on things like recurring errors in the administration of medicine, deadly kinds of errors that have been repeated from one institution to the next that lead to reforms, including, for example, the withdrawal of a syringe that uh, was contributing to the confusion. Um, there are many examples like this, and I think the other thing that is troubling is the fact that the agencies are so uneven in their handling of requests of this nature. Uh, two journalists that work for American Journal gave us their uh, examples of how the FAA um, was very cooperative on a computerized request. By contrast, the FBI was extremely difficult. Let me conclude by saying that, as was raised earlier this morning, delays of this nature, obfuscation of this nature really does deprive not just journalists but the public of valuable information. And we think that good citizens need this information while it can still be useful. And we hope that the work of this committee and others in Congress will help uh, fulfill the aspirations for participatory democracy that were articulated 30 years ago in the enactment of the Freedom of Information Act. I thank you for your most helpful statement. Attached to your written testimony is an exhibit uh, entitled The Clinton Administration and the News Media, 
a summary of 305 actions by the Clinton administration aimed at restricting access to government information and intruding on editorial freedom. Now, I notice in some of the examples you gave, which you didn't get into these, which are, take up 42 pages and they're simply little capsule summaries, yes. but uh, do you feel after listening to your colleagues in the media, after going after some of these requests, that where the agency really tightens up and circles the wagons, if you will, in the old Western term, is when someone in the agency ha has their name in the file, and if revealed, the agency would not be held in good standing or its image would be harmed. Do you think that has given differential treatment in some of the agencies? Or do we just have a few crotchety types that don't like doing things? Um, I, I suspect that it's a combination of both. Um, I think that it is fair to say that perhaps as a legacy of former administrations, there is a tendency in the agencies to invoke the privacy exemption in ways that I would characterize in sometimes as opportunistic. I mean, we're all concerned about protecting people's privacy. Although, um, I mean, with all due respect, I think the government is really the biggest invader of citizens' privacy by collecting information in the first instance. There are sometimes good reasons for that, sometimes less compelling reasons. Having said that, though, the privacy exemption and its misuse, in our experience, has become the number one obstacle to gaining access to information. Uh, are there any other portions of the other three laws we're considering that uh, have also some impact on that delay and bringing up hurdles that you are aware of? Well, you mean the, the Federal Advisory right. Committee Act and so forth? Right. Um, I think that um, uh, there are certainly serious issues with the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Back when I was working in private practice, one of the first cases I litigated had to do with the Federal Advisory Committee Act. What we uh, said was a Federal Advisory Committee Act agency, and we were told by the courts it was not. Um, I think that this is a problematic area. Um, if someone had told me that about three months after the Clinton administration uh, came into office, we would be filing a friend of the court brief um, in support of those seeking access to the health care task force, um, I would have been chagrined, to say the least. There are problems there. Um, as I said earlier, I do think that the Sunshine Act um, amendments that are being proposed by the American Bar Association and others um, bear serious scrutiny, and, and I don't mean that in a positive sense. There is self-interest involved here, um, oftentimes well-meaning on the part of some of the uh, members of the collegial agencies who are suggesting um, that they would work better in secret. But I truly think that the history of our democracy has shown that public oversight is essential, um, not only to make sure the government functions well, but also so that citizens may see the government function well. Uh, without objection, all of the exhibits and all of the testimony will be put into the record uh, just after the individual is introduced. We now have another working reporter, uh, Mr. Byron York, reporter for the American Spectator. Uh, Mr. York. Hi. Um, I am here because of a story I wrote in late 1993. Uh, at the time, Vice President Al Gore had just released his plan. Excuse me? Is this working? Yeah, pull it up closer to you. Okay. I'm here because of a story I wrote in late 1993. Uh, at the time, Vice President Al Gore had just released his plan to reinvent government. To unveil the work, Mr. Gore and President Clinton stood on the White House lawn, surrounded by huge piles of documents they said represented the reams of needless regulations and paperwork in government. They said reinventing government would save the taxpayers $108 billion. But as the Vice President praised the many people who had worked on the project and the exhaustive work that they had done, uh, a question occurred to me, which was, how much did reinventing government itself cost? Uh, it seemed like a reasonable inquiry. At the time, there were similar questions about the administration's other big task force, the one on health care reform. You may remember the administration originally said that one cost $100,000, a figure they later up to $200,000, and much later, the GAO discovered it was more like $14 uh, million. So the day after the reinventing government rollout, I sent a Freedom of Information Act request seeking the financial facts of the Gore Task Force. My questions were standard stuff. What is the overall budget? How many employees are there? How much do they make? How much is spent on offices, travel, consultants, and the like? A few days later, Todd Campbell, counsel to the Vice President, sent me a letter that said simply, quote, 
FOIA does not entitle you to records or other materials of the National Performance Review, and that was that. Now, I know that some parts of the White House are indeed exempt from FOIA, but I also knew that that didn't apply to the entire Executive Office of the President. Uh, for example, I had successfully FOIA documents uh, from the Office of National Drug Control Policy about the travels of uh, then drug czar Lee Brown. Surely the reinventing government task fell into that sort of category, so I called the Justice Department. Spokesman Carl Stern told me that government experts believe there were legal grounds to argue that the Vice President's office is not subject to FOIA, but then he said, quote, it's a matter that hasn't been litigated, so you could argue it either way. The administration's position became a little ironic a few weeks later when President Clinton sent that memo to the chiefs of all government agencies ordering them to cooperate fully with FOIA requests. Uh, openness in government is essential to accountability, the President said, and the act has become an integral part of that process. And then he said it's not enough for agencies simply to be more open to FOIA requests. He wanted the government to distribute information on its own so the public wouldn't have to resort to FOIA to find out what was going on. On the same day, Janet Reno, the Attorney General, said the Justice Department would no longer routinely defend agencies that refused to release information requested under the Act. Experts I talked to at the time thought the action was long overdue, and they pointed to Reagan and Bush administration agencies that had stonewalled and dragged their feet on FOIA requests and said they hoped the Clinton administration's action would signal a new day. So I pointed these things out to the people at the National Performance Review. There's a new policy on FOIA, I said, and you guys are supposed to be more open. Their answer, however, uh, remained the same, which was no. Um, then I pointed out the part of the President's statement in which he said citizens shouldn't have to rely on FOIA to get information about their government. I sent a letter to the NPR asking that in the spirit of the President's directive they simply release the financial records of the reinventing government group. The answer was still no. Um, this went on for quite a while, a few months. Although I was able to get snippets of information from other agencies that were involved in reinventing government, my article about the price of reinventing government turned into an article about how it was impossible to learn the price of reinventing government, and it was eventually called Reinventing Secrecy. And that's it. That's uh, very helpful. Let me ask some general questions. They're going to be hard to answer in this sense. You've all had different experiences, but I'm trying to get a collective experience here based on the fact that you have worked the system. Uh, you've each testified about the difficulties in getting timely responses to Freedom of Information Act requests. Now, based on your collective experiences, where are the delays the longest? Which agencies resist fulfilling these requests the most? And what's the longest delay that uh, requesters, either yourself or those that you represent or those that you have known, work for? And uh, have, where have they encountered these uh, obtaining responses from these agencies? Where's the stiffening of the stiffing, rather, of these agencies? They stiffed the minority in this Congress, in the 103rd Congress. So we were onto that health care task force from day one just as we were on Travelgate, but uh, we never got anywhere until we got the majority and the subpoena power. Now, you don't have the subpoena power, and uh, what are we going to do? What's, where can you point us in the direction where the problems are? Who'd like to be first? Why don't we just go backwards down the line, Mr. York? Well, the, the problem is, is you're asking them stuff they don't want to tell you. So uh, the bigger the agency, I think the longer it takes, but the... Uh, I've had uh, different experiences with smaller groups. I FOIA'd uh, in the last days of Lawrence Walsh's invest uh, Iran-Contra investigation. I FOIA'd the office for some of his financial records, and they were very good. They were very open. They gave me the stuff. They answered my questions, uh, and I did a story that was very critical of his spending, but it, I thought it all worked the way it should. Later, I did a piece for the Wall Street Journal about um, uh, some of the expenses of uh, Andrew Cuomo, one of the top officials at HUD, and it was really like pulling teeth. They just didn't want to tell me anything. As a matter of fact, one of his top assistants at the time was Mark Fabiani, who's now working for the White House. And uh, I just had a, a terrible time trying to fi find out things. And I eventually received some stuff, but I believe to this day that I did not get uh, a full accounting of what I, was, uh, what I was looking for. So the real problem occurs when you're uh, asking, a, asking for information about somebody who's political, and they don't want to tell you. Uh, Ms. Kirtley, you've got quite a few clients that you represent, so you must have a lot of experiences you hear about. Well, Which agencies seem to be worse than most, if that's possible? Well, I think the um, FBI probably 
gets that dubious distinction. Um, it's an experience that we hear from repeatedly from the folks that call us. It's an experience we're dealing with now. I have a request before the FBI that I think has been pending about four years. Well, you're um, about due for a reply then. Well, I, I got a you reply. You should have a happy it's, smile on your face. <laughs> I got a reply, but it's uh, in terms of getting the substance, it's, it's still going to be a while. One of the examples in our uh, uh, Clinton administration report, which you have for the record, uh, speaks of a journalist for the Post Standard in Syracuse who got a letter from the Department of the Army Intelligence and Security Command five years after he filed the request saying that his request for information about the Pan Am uh, crash in Scotland would not be answered within the 10-day time frame. Um, I, uh, I, there have been problems with the departments of the Army, Navy, Air Force. The Marines are a little bit better, I think, is, is most people's experience. Um, DOE has had a bad reputation in the past, as have many of the scientific agencies. Uh, NASA, for example, uh, closed down quite a bit after the Challenger disaster, ironically enough, I think. And we've had a lot of complaints from journalists who cover the scientific beat about having difficulty getting information out of NIH and some of the other, um, again, scientific agencies. So those would be sort of my top five list. Your comment on defense reminded me, and I was sharing this experience with some of the staff the other night, that when I was in the Army Strategic Intelligence Reserve and put in some of my summertime at the Pentagon, I actually did see a top civilian employee take the New York Times, put the top secret uh, stamp on it, and file it. And uh, I thought, gee, that is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. But it couldn't have happened again. And when I've shared that with others, they say, yeah, we've been in the Pentagon, and we've seen that happen, too. So It's absolutely true. And many journalists who uh, ask the FBI and other agencies for their records on themselves will find their own stories in those files uh, yeah. many years later. Well, they have, I guess, enemies lists all over town, the media, the Congress, et cetera. So how about you, Mr. Clayman? What's your worst example? Well, I, th I have a number of worse examples. Okay. Uh, and it stems from a basic problem, and that is lack of independence in decision making in the agencies. Certainly, we've had bad experiences with Commerce, although the FOIA officer, if she had been able to make the decision herself, would have done the right thing. The problem is it was taken away from her by the Secretary's office. This happens frequently that political appointees will step in who have an interest, as you pointed out in protecting information. That's why I raised this issue with uh, the staff of, of late Secretary Brown, is that they had an interest in not having our FOIA information come out. They were working with him, and apparently in other respects as well. So we need an independent entity really calling the shots at these, at these uh, departments. And what makes it doubly troubling is that if you do have to bring a lawsuit, as we've had to do on a number of occasions, the agency that defends is the Department of Justice. Now, that's an executive branch agency. Uh, no one in their right mind, if it's a highly sensitive issue like selling trade missions for, for dollars, is going to uh, willy-nilly follow Mr. Clinton's policies to release everything. And what you have here is a politicization of the Justice Department, and I'm an alumnus like I've never seen in 20 years, where the Attorney General apparently either she or those under her, must step in and make a decision to put up roadblocks to not allow this information to be released. And if we, when you compare that policy that President Clinton put in when he took office, we're going to release everything, even if it's arguably confidential, and see the way it actually is being carried out, particularly when it concerns him and his appointees, you'd think that you were not living in the United States. You'd think you were back in the, in the Soviet Union with regard to the uh, lack of desire to allow democracy to work. And it, to me, it's been very disillusioning. So we need independence. And yeah. that stems inside the agency. And we need a way that the Justice Department or some other entity uh, can uh, handle a lawsuit such that the Attorney General does not put his or her imprint on whether that case is going to be uh, defended and stonewalled and carried out to the point where ordinary citizens uh, can't pursue their rights. Well, it was mentioned that uh, in some cases the Department of Justice has said, we will not defend you. Now, certainly if people were violating the law, they would get the message, hey, I don't want to have to go get my own lawyer. So what's your feeling as to how we solve that problem? Should we create an independent 
a commission or office where appeals could be made outside of the agency where they're protecting their image and their corporate culture and their political hide and all the rest. I think that something like that would be preferable. And you mentioned something earlier about attorney's fees. So I also feel that it's one thing to have the government pay. Right. But if the individuals who are responsible for the stonewalling had to pay out of their own pocket, they might be less likely to stonewall. Well, it also might be we'll never get an employee in one of these <laughs> operations either. That may be. Uh, so I may be a bit too idealistic. Mr. Somewhere Chairman. in between, we'll work out yeah. something. Ms. But Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Orr. Um, I would agree with Mr. Clayman about the attorney's fees. I would like to see it come out of, out of the pockets of the people who are doing the stonewalling. Um, I know that's impractical, but it would um, probably do wonders for the backlog. And um, I, also, I, I also agree with them that certainly holding back, withholding records are, is political in nature. My experience has been that the, de that the long delays come when there is classified material involved, i.e., I have a one request at the DOD for 1952 documents. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it went from Los Alamos National Labs to the DOE to the DOD, and it's under review there, and then it'll go back to the DOE, back to Los Alamos, and back to me long after I, I won't need it anymore. You know, it will, it, it will be no longer needed information. Um, so those are the cases that I've found is mostly when there's classified information. And it seems like, and I'm not a software expert, but it's just like with privacy records, that if there were records made where you, had, uh, cl where you could segregate classified information electronically so that you, you could sort your documents, and then when there was a FOIA request, release those uh, by pushing the button of a computer. I mean, that's very, that's coming. So uh, that was just, a, just an idea I had. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that I, I would like you to put my statement into the record. Oh, it's automatic. Oh, okay. Right after you were introduced, your full statement will appear, and then so will your testimony. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, I must say, when I listened to the Department of Defense witness this morning mention the First World War and that records were still around from there, uh, that did pique my interest, and we're going to pursue that with staff as to what are the records that are still closed from the First World War. Now, I do know one who was in that war who's still alive, Fred Hummer of the Long Beach area, plays taps, and he was in the First World War. But uh, I'm just curious what they're sitting on over there that's so delicate. There, it's, it's incredible what they're sitting on it, and she just, even, even the DOE FOIA people have told me they go into Suitland Records Center, and they said, that's scary in there. I mean, good luck, because we need to get that information out. Let me uh, close on questions for this panel, since uh, some of you have mentioned part of the electronic transfer. Has anyone on the panel found the Internet or specifically agency websites useful in obtaining information from agencies? Has there been any experience? Any, I'm about to put in an electronic reporting bill. That's why I'm interested in this. Um, a lot of our callers have found it quite useful. I mean, their journalists tend to be uh, sort of internet savvy users and they're good at plugging into things. Um, the Thomas system, for example, which is not executive branch, it's congressional, has been very useful certainly to my small organization, which really can't afford to pay for the proprietary uh, provision of government information. So it's, it's a godsend to us and to many other similarly situated groups. Um, I mean, I think that the promise of, uh, of what this can mean in terms of real citizen access from every corner of the globe, not to mention within the, the borders of this country, is, is truly phenomenal. And those agencies that have affirmatively moved to put things online without even uh, being directed to do so, I, I think, deserve to be commended. Well, uh, thank you for saying that, because the Library of Congress, I think, has done a superb operation yes. with the Thomas, named for Thomas Jefferson. Uh, system, and that is the speaker's main goal, is to get every single congressional document that we have in document rooms on digital computer, and uh, any American could tap into that, and you don't have to pay a lobbyist a thousand dollars a day to get the report for you. So the goal is to 
make this place completely accessible to the average citizen. On electronic records uh, in general, as opposed to the Internet agency websites, we would be interested in your ideas on this if you think they ought to be in legislation, because we're just in the process of rounding out the draft on that bill. So we'll either let the staff know privately or whatever, write us a note or send Mr. George a note, and uh, that'll be very helpful. Well, I thank you very much. There's a lot more questions we could ask you. Staff might be sending you some. We'd be grateful if you take the time to respond if we feel there's a hole in the record somewhere. So thank you. And we have two more panels, and I'd like to uh, combine those panels uh, so we can uh, sort of have a play relationship there since we have both government officials and uh, people that represent private entities. And I think we could probably make sure we keep our time commitments to the next group that's in here. So if uh, Mr. Mar Wagner, Mr. Dean, Mr. May, and Mr. Kaminar would come forward, we will swear you in and begin that panel. Okay, gentlemen, if you'd stand and, stand and raise your uh, right hand, uh, do you swear that in the testimony you're about to give the subcommittee it will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Note to the clerk that all four witnesses affirmed, and we'll begin with Mr. Wagner, the Associate Administrator for the Office of Policy, Planning and Evaluation of the General Services Administration. Mr. Wagner. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to discuss with you today the relationship of the Federal Advisory Committee Act to federal information policy. I am accompanied by James L. Dean, Director of GSA's Committee Management Secretariat. Mr. Chairman, in order to allow for the subcommittee's specific questions, I will keep my remarks brief. Accordingly, I respectfully request that the full text of my prepared statement yeah. be entered into the record. Full text, uh, full text is automatically entered. Uh, we would like to have you look us in the eye and summarize it in five minutes if you could. We'll do that. And that will leave more time for questions from Ms. Maloney and myself. Okay. FACA addresses the importance of establishing an open process allowing the pu public to know who is providing advice and recommendations to the government's policy makers. For more than a quarter century before the enactment of the Act in 1972, the federal government began to recognize the important role played by the advisory committees in developing effective policies. As the influence and number of advisory committees grew during the post-World War II period, so did concerns regarding their management, cost, and accountability. FACA addresses these issues by establishing a continuing process for evaluating the need for establishing and continuing advisory committees. While FACA generally is recognized for its emphasis on controlling the number and costs of advisory committees, its provisions governing access to committee meetings and records are equally important. Where FOIA's provisions, for example, apply to pre-existing documents, FACA's goal is to provide contemporaneous access to meetings and materials generated for use by federal advisory committees during their deliberations. One of the first access statutes, FACA requires that each meeting be open to the public, except as otherwise allowed for by the Sunshine Act, that timely notice of each meeting be provided, that the public be allowed to participate in committee sessions, and that committee documents and minutes be made available. The fundamental information management policy reflected in FACA is sound and has stood the test of time. During fiscal year 1994, 4,109 advisory committee meetings were held. Of that number, 2,603, or 63% of the total, were open to or partially open to the public. During this period, 1,245 committee reports were issued and made available to the public. The executive branch is also increasing its efforts to make it easier for the public to participate in its decision-making processes through other means. For example, the public is becoming more actively involved through the use of satellite video conferencing, the Internet, and other tools such as 800 numbers. With increasing pressure to reduce costs while at the same time providing for expanded opportunities for the public to become actively involved in government, 
Agencies using advisory committees can leverage these complementary tools to boost the availability of information. GSA's Committee Management Secretariat, mandated by Section 7 of FACA, issues guidelines, provides government-wide policy and oversight of approximately 1,000 advisory committees, prepares the annual report of the President on federal advisory committees, annually reviews the continuing need for existing groups, and provides a range of assistance to federal agencies on FACA issues. These activities provide a broad base of information which is made available to the Congress and members of the public who are interested in participating in committee activities or obtaining information. As a result of the administration's efforts to encourage greater local participation and decision making, more advisory committee activities are being targeted to support field initiatives. The Secretariat is continuing to work with both headquarters and field staffs to assure compliance with FACA and in particular to develop specific strategies to achieve maximum public access. In the future, the question will not be should we include the public in the design and implementation of federal policies and programs. Instead, if we are going to be truly effective, the issue will be how do we develop policies which fully recognize the value of public participation as a strategic asset. Given the rapid changes that are taking place, changes which dramatically alter the public's expectations of government, we must be prepared to provide timely policy, guidance, training, and support to frontline federal managers. GSA is committed to meeting that channel, challenge. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, that concludes my uh, oral summary. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much. We'll wait till all of you are done, and then we'll have ten minutes to a side here. Uh, Mr. D uh, Dean, please proceed. If you uh, I have no opening statement, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield to the next witness. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. May. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Randolph May, a partner in the law firm of Sutherland Aswan Brennan. I appear before you today principally in my capacity as the former chairman of the Special Committee to Review the Government and the Sunshine Act of the Administrative Conference of the United States. The Special Committee was established in the spring of 1995 in response to a request by SEC Commissioner Stephen Wallman and 12 other present and former agency commissioners asking that the conference take a fresh look at how the Government and the Sunshine Act is working in practice. Composed of agency officials, public interest representatives, lawyers who practice before agencies, and an academic, the committee held several meetings and a public hearing before reaching its conclusions. In October 1995, it released its report recommending changes in the Sunshine Act, and I would like to devote my testimony to summarizing briefly how the law operates in the report's recommendations. The Sunshine Act requires, with only a few exceptions, that all meetings among members of multi-member agencies and commissions, such as the SEC and the FCC and so forth, be held in public after at least seven days' advance notice. A meeting is defined as, quote, deliberations of at least the number of agency members required to take action on behalf of the agency where such deliberations determine or result in the joint disposition or conduct of official agency business. The law does not restrict, for example, the EPA administrator from having non-public meetings at any time with her staff officials. The primary stated goal of the Sunshine Act is to enhance the public's understanding of the agency decision-making process. The Special Committee found considerable evidence, however, that the Act is not working as intended to provide the public with meaningful access to agency decision-making. What's more, it found considerable evidence that the law is having a harmful impact on the quality of agency decision making at the agencies by impeding collegial deliberation. A principal reason that Congress creates multi-member agencies is to gain the benefits that result from agency members with differing political philosophies, experiences, and expertises deliberating collectively. If the Sunshine Act is in fact impeding collegial deliberation, then two expressions of congressional intent are indeed working at cross purposes with each other. In the time allotted for my testimony, I can't detail all the reasons why meaningful collective deliberation, as opposed to mere announcements, 
by individual agency members of previously arrived at positions generally does not take place at the public meetings. For now, suffice it to say that the committee found a widespread consensus that in fact collective deliberation generally does not take place. Agency members most often do little more than announce or briefly explain decisions they've already reached. Rather than being able to hash out the pros and cons of a particular decision in a collective deliberative process, agency members rely on their staffs to negotiate with the staffs of other agency members or on one-on-one -on -one meetings with other commissioners. While this mode of operation enhances the power of commissioner staffs and requires an extraordinary increase in time and effort if agency members hold a series on one -on of one-on-one -on -one meetings with other commissioners, it does little to promote collegiality among the commissioners. The necessity to avoid all non-public discussions of agency business necessarily inhibits the development of trusting and cooperative relationships among commissioners who each have an equal vote and responsibility for the agency's actions. Communications which must take place indirectly through intermediaries suffer from all the infirmities inherent in any process of third-party communication. What to do? Some who agree that the Sunshine Act generally is not providing the public with a real view of agency decision making say that the fault lies with all of the agency members. They are public officials, some say, and they should be forced to deliberate in public. In other words, it's not the Sunshine Act that needs reforming, it's the public officials. The Administrative Conference Committee concluded otherwise recommending that Congress modify the act to establish a pilot program for a period of five to seven years to allow agency members to meet in private to discuss agency business if such members are memorialized by a detailed summary of the meeting to be placed in the public record within five days of such meeting. The summary would allow the public to know that a meeting had been held to discuss a particular subject and to know the general nature of the discussion. This is more information about the status and nature of the consideration of a matter than the public now receives when closed door deliberations are conducted through the staff or through one-on-one -on -one meetings of the agency members. Importantly, before an agency could participate in the pilot program allowing private meetings subject to the detailed memorialization requirement, it would have to agree to the extent practicable to conduct votes and take other official actions on all significant public matters in regularly scheduled open meetings rather than employing notation or circulation voting procedures which are now common at many agencies. Keep in mind that the Sunshine Act does not prohibit agencies from voting on major issues by circulating written proposals among the commissioners. Of course, when issues are decided by notation voting, the public has no access whatever to the deliberative process. The Special Committee's recommendation for change, at least on a trial basis, which would then be evaluated carefully, is premised on the belief that it ought to be possible, through modifications to the Act, to achieve the twin goals of actually enhancing the public's understanding of the, of the agency decision-making process by making more information available and also fostering true collegial decision-making in a way that too often today is missing in our multi-member agencies. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee today, and hopefully the Administrative Conference Committee recommendation will spur interest in taking a fresh look at how the Sunshine Act is really working at present and whether its operation can be improved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that most uh, helpful statement. Uh, our last witness is Paul Kaminar, the Executive Director of the Washington Legal Foundation. Mr. Kaminar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am Paul Kaminar. My correct title is Executive Legal Director, but uh, close enough. Uh, the Washington Legal the Foundation is a, a nonprofit public interest law and policy center based here in Washington, D.C. We're dedicated to the principles of the uh, promoting the free enterprise system as well as a limited and accountable government. And we advance our objectives through litigation in the courts and through publishing materials uh, with our legal studies, found, uh, legal studies division. And since its founding in 1977, our foundation has represented over 650 members of Congress, state legislators, state attorneys generals, governors, municipalities, victim rights groups, and civic organizations, property rights groups, small business owners, 
in promoting the uh, uh, principles uh, of our foundation. And uh, I would like to focus my remarks uh, this afternoon on our litigation with, under the Federal Advisory Committee Act uh, uh, and maybe address some of the other issues as well. Our main case that we filed in 1985 was against the American Bar Association's uh, Committee on Federal Judiciary to have them come under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. As you know, the coverage under the Act extends to all committees that are, quote, established or utilized, end quote, by government agencies. Well, the ABA committee was not established by the federal government, but they certainly are utilized by the Justice Department and by the President in terms of evaluating the characteristics and qualifications of federal judicial nominees. In 95, we sued the committee and its chairman, Robert Fisk, Jr., uh, because they were sharing and leaking information about their uh, judicial nominees with liberal activist groups, particularly the Alliance for Justice. When we got wind of that, we uh, asked Mr. Fisk to give us the information and attend their meetings, and they said, no, we're not subject to the Advisory Committee Act. Uh, go away, and we ended up in court. The uh, district court uh, ruled that certainly ruled that certainly the ABA committee comes within the coverage and, and purview of the Federal Advisory Committee Act because they certainly are utilized by uh, the, the Justice Department. However, the district court held that it would be a violation of separation of powers for the act to apply to the ABA because of the president's nominating powers, even though uh, there was no evidence in the court record at all that there would be any interference with the president's nominating powers. And this is particularly a strange argument to make since the uh, Federal Advisory Committee Act was being successfully applied to the President's Advisory Committee on Ambassadorial Appointments, which performed precisely the same function that the ABA Committee did with judicial uh, candidates. Uh, Public Citizen finally joined in our case, uh, and we took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in a very much criticized opinion that the ABA Committee really isn't utilized by the Justice Department as Congress intended when they passed the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Uh, they said, uh, we're going to interpret the word utilize to mean that if the uh, putative advisory committee is controlled or managed by the government agency, and since there was no evidence that the Justice Department actually controls the ABA committee, the ABA committee gets this free ride in terms of being uh, uh, exempted from the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Uh, and uh, we think that that is a serious problem under the law, and there's been other litigation since then that the lower courts have used to exempt coverage of the Federal Advisory Committee Act to uh, organizations out there. I'd like to bring up another example that raises a different problem. Our suit against the Sensing Commission has an advisory committee that uh, uh, is advising it on, on, on establishing sensing guidelines for environmental offenses. We asked to, be, uh, to attend those meetings and to get the documents. The Sensing Commission made the amazing argument that we're not even a government agency. And the way they made that argument is that if you look at the FOIA, Federal Advisory Committee Act, Sunshine Act, that all applies to government agencies as defined by the Administrative Procedure Act. And the Administrative Procedure Act defines a government agency as everything under the sun except Congress and the courts. And the uh, Census Commission said if you squint at that word courts, it really means the entire judicial branch. And since we're in the judicial branch, we get a free ride in, under uh, being accountable to the American people. Uh, we argued that case to the Court of Appeals. Chief Judge Abner Mikva agreed with the Sentencing Commission, threw us out. We're in that court again, raising another argument that if, you're, if, if, if we can't get the documents under the Advisory Committee Act or FOIA or anything else, we'll get it under the common law doctrine of public access to records. That's the same doctrine that news agencies go to courts to get the videotapes of depositions and, 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 and transcripts of audio tapes because, of course, courts are exempt from FOIA. So how do news agencies get it? They use the common law doctrine of public records. So we say, well, if you're a court for purposes of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, we'll get the documents under the common law doctrine. They came in on the second lawsuit and said, well, we're not a court, so you can't get it under that either. So they're playing the shell game, and this case was argued uh, uh, eight months ago, and we expect a decision any day. Uh, another suit we filed just recently on behalf of members of Congress against an EPA for failing to submit a cost-benefit report on the Clean Air Act. Also involves an advisory committee which simply doesn't even keep minutes of its meeting. Something basic as that. Uh, they they uh, failed to have minutes of their meeting. And uh, finally, I know you're also looking at uh, uh, the uh, FOIA uh, uh, 
application in the Justice Department. I noticed the Justice Department was here earlier this morning and testified, giving you glowing uh, uh, reviews of how great they're applying the law and so forth, but yet we've heard a lot of uh, uh, cases where they're actually blocking access. And I just want to submit for the record, I have attached to my testimony, I asked the Justice Department recently to send me a list of all criminal cases on wetland violators, because that's a big policy issue that's going on. And they uh, sent me a document that's redacted uh, all the defendants. It's, it's U.S. versus, and then you have the redaction because of concerns of privacy, unwanted privacy. These are criminal cases that are held in public trials, uh, uh, and some of these cases uh, have already been decided years ago. And yet, for, for fear of an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy, they're leaving out the name of the defendant in these cases. And, 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 and the Justice Department has the, has the nerve to come up here and say how they're the leader in, 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 in terms of uh, providing access under FOIA. So there are a lot of problems here. Uh, I urge this committee to address them, and we'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Do you want a question for five minutes, or do you want to vote? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Maloney will question you for five minutes. I'm going to respond to the roll call that's going on on the floor. She will have to leave after five minutes uh, to come over and join me in that vote. So we'll be in recess for between 10 and 15 minutes in order to, for me to get back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Wagner, uh, the, the President in his uh, 1994 report to Congress on Federal Advisory Committees submitted uh, July 10, 1995, stated that he had directed GSA to review actions to involve citizens more thoroughly in the development of decisions. He indicated a possible legislative proposal to promote such uh, participation. And uh, your statement lists certain of these actions, such as the internet and tele teleconferencing of town hall meetings. Uh, please tell us what things GSA has done or, or planned to help integrate the public into uh, federal policy or management. Uh, before, before that, I would really like to ask uh, the chairman, I'm sure he wouldn't object, uh, to submit to the record the Bush administration and the news media, the Reporters Committee on Freedom of the Press, they, they put in such a chronology on the Clinton administration. I think it's only fair to have the, the chronology likewise put in on the, on the Bush administration. Hearing no objection? All right. Thank you. Uh, I think it would be best if Mr. Dean, who uh, runs our committee management secretariat, Great. would address the specifics of that question. Thank you. I'll try to answer your question. Uh, during the past two years, there's been uh, literally an explosion across the country by uh, part of federal agencies to reach out and deal more effectively with the public. Uh, GSA has been looking at uh, many different ways to, to help these agencies deal not only with FACA issues, but also to help them address other tools that are available to, to them in, in terms of bringing the public in and, and uh, giving them better access. For example, uh, we have um, been beefing up our training activities. Uh, we've been going to the field uh, and helping people understand what FACA is, because uh, until recently, a lot of folks in the field didn't understand what the Federal Advisory Committee was. They couldn't even spell FACA. So, uh, so we had to go out and reach out and touch those folks. Uh, we've also been talking to them and trying to learn about what they do in the field. And spending most of our time in Washington has been really enlightening to find out what kind of unique problems they have, what kind of constituents they have. Uh, everything from dealing with people in, in the forest to dealing with urban issues and so forth. So we have uh, spent a considerable amount of time, for example, working with the folks involved in the uh, President's Forest Plan in Portland, Oregon. We have dispatched training teams at the Boise, Idaho, folks that are involved in environmental issues. Uh, we have spent a lot of time in Denver uh, working with the Department of Energy to find out what's happening with the cleanup of nuclear waste sites. And we've learned a great deal. And what we've learned, quite frankly, is that one size does not fit all. Has any legislation been developed, as he so suggested in his directive? It has not yet because, quite frankly, I think we're still learning. And I think that we're still getting comments back. The, wor the world is changing a lot. Uh, a lot of agencies are, 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 are using the Internet, the World Wide Web. They're using satellite video conferencing. They're, they're, exper they're experimenting with a lot of these mm -hmm. things. And we're not quite sure how it's going to shake out. 
uh, we see a lot of innovative things going what, on. What elements might uh, any legislation that you develop uh, contain? Have you okay. given any thought to it? Or? Yes, I, I think we have. I, I think that, as, as Marty mentioned, the, the basic policy contained in fact is, is sound. I, I think it has withstood the test of time. First of all, the committee should be open and accessible, and their costs should be contained, and the numbers should be reduced consistent with the government's needs. Uh, but again, what we've learned is, is that while the process is associated with setting up committees at the macro level is pretty straightforward and streamlined, the biggest complaint that I actually get two big complaints. One is it takes too long to create a committee in my department, whether it's the Department of Widgets or whatever. Uh, the internal process that they go through to get management approval can sometimes take days, might, weeks, months, a year. Uh, that's not necessarily bad because it depends on what issue is being discussed. You need to get the stakeholders to agree that that's a necessary thing to do. So that's the positive side. The downside is that, uh, and we've been working with agencies on this, is to try to find ways to get things done faster. If you need a committee and it's a, it's a validated requirement, you shouldn't have to wait a year. The, the five-minute bell has been um, okay. called for a vote, and I'll have to join the chairman voting on the floor. We're in recess for 10 minutes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Subcommittee hearing will resume. Uh, the next question, the first question I'm going to ask, uh, let me deal primarily with GSA, but on any of these questions, you two gentlemen are welcome to chime in on your views also. Uh, this is uh, offered to me by Congressman Ramstad of Minnesota, a very able member of the House, and it's regarding the U.S. Forest Service interpretation of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which you administer. And he notes, we've heard complaints from the public about how the Federal Advisory Committee Act has been interpreted by the U.S. Forest Service in a way that discourages citizen input on the management of the federal lands. Among other things, the Federal Advisory Committee Act was intended to prevent advisory committees, which are established or utilized by federal agencies, from being inappropriately influenced by a special interest. Now, the Federal Advisory Committee Act was not intended to prevent citizen groups that approach the government on their own initiative from providing input and advice. However, the Forest Service has used the Federal Advisory Committee Act as a reason to disband citizen work groups such as those formed to provide public involvement for the limits of acceptable change process, referred to in forest terminology as the LAC process. The Forest Service has taken the position that the Federal Advisory Committee Act requires it to reject consensus-based information from citizen groups. Can you tell us why the Forest Service has taken such an extreme <coughs> position in its interpretation of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, and what, if anything, is being done about it? And is the General Services Administration aware of that interpretation? Uh, okay. Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Dean has Mr. some Dean. specific information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, two years ago, we were approached by the Forest Service as they were launching uh, several uh, initiatives to uh, actively involve their citizens in their programs. It, it was brought to our, our attention that, that the Forest Service, uh, there, there was some confusion over the applicability of the Federal Advisory Committee Act to pre-existing groups such as groups formed by the citizens on their own volition and whether or not 
those groups could come to the government and offer advice and recommendations. Last year, uh, in the late fall, GSA and the Department of Justice met with the Forest Service and senior officials from USDA, and we helped them craft a new piece of guidance that was issued in, on October 2, 1995, which largely, which largely addressed these kinds of concerns. The chief of the Forest Service has clarified and I think corrected the earlier uh, misperceptions uh, or confusion regarding the status of outside groups. There, his guidance clearly provides, for example, that if citizens who have created the group on their own initiative come to the Forest Service, it's okay to, uh, to meet with them and to accept their advice and recommendations. I am not aware at this point in time of any, of any major problem uh, across the country with regard to the current guidance. However, uh, I would like to suggest that we contact the Forest Service and see if this is still an issue. And if it is, we'd like to work with them on uh, training or whatever it takes to clear it up. Well, I'd appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And if you could, uh, we'll keep the record open for a few weeks. Uh, we'll get an answer from you, maybe jointly with the Forest Service, as to what is the situation now. Sure. Because I'm also going to include in the record is an article from the fall 1994 issue uh, of well, they don't seem to have a decent citation here, but it was mm -hmm. attached, and we'll figure it out. And the headline is, Forest Service Disbands Citizen Work Group, otherwise known as CWGs. And it goes back to some of the explanation of their side at this time. And uh, I'd like to just yes. round that out, because it seems sort of silly to me that you're disbanding, or they were disbanding, citizen work groups and saying, sorry, the law says we don't need you. Mr. Chairman, I do have a copy of that uh, article. Yeah, what is the source of that? It appears to be a publication of the Forest Service in the uh, Frank Church River of No Return area. And I would just like to note for the record that this article is dated uh, in 1994, which, of course, is before the Forest Service had changed its policy. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe today that we would not see an article of this type being published in the in, in this area. Yeah. But we will get yeah. with the Forest yeah. Service yeah. and, and sure. give you an up-to-date and, and if they have a policy and a policy statement, let's put that in the record and share it with Mr. Ramstead. We'd be happy to. Let me go into some uh, general questions on advisory committees. Uh, in a study the General Accounting Office did, and I think you referred to it in 1987, there were 992 advisory committees consisting of 19,837 members cost to the government was $79 million. Now, according to the information supplied by GSA, there are currently 967 advisory committees, which are less advisory committees, consisting of over 30,000 members, which are roughly uh, one-third more. You went from 20,000 to 30,000, costing the federal government an estimated $160 million, uh, roughly double the amount in 1987. Mm -hmm. And the actual 94 figure, I hear, was uh, 133 million. Now, the question is obvious. Isn't the Federal Advisory Committee Act's purpose <coughs> to reduce the number of these committees and their cost to the government? What's uh, the response? Before passing the, uh, on to Mr. Dean, who has some specific figures on, on the, uh, the dollars, I, I, would, I would agree that one of the purposes of the Advisory Committee Act is, is to minimize costs. But I think it's also important that we, we focus on the level playing field, the giving of access, and that sometimes I get concerned that in our desire to have cost effectiveness, which is important within the, the, the various processes we run, we also want openness. And uh, sometimes in f it, would be, it is better sometimes to have an advisory committee and spend some money than it would be to have no advisory committee at all. But um, uh, I, we also share your concern in terms of cost. We've taken some steps in that direction. I believe uh, Mr. Dean has some specifics on what those trends are mm -hmm. doing. Please, Mr. Mr. Dean. Chairman, I, I'd like to, if, if, if there's no objection, talk a little bit about what the administration has done to reduce the number and cost of advisory committees. Sure. In uh, February of 1993, uh, as one of his official acts, President Clinton signed Executive Order 12838 which addressed the questions you posed. 
He directed the executive branch to terminate at least one-third of the number of so-called discretionary committees. Discretionary committees are defined as those which are created under the general authority of agencies or those which are authorized by Congress but which are not directed. At the time, we had a baseline uh, based upon the end of 92 numbers of 801 discretionary committees, and we terminated 267, actually 284 of those groups. And the President has set an effective ceiling of 534 uh, discretionary committees uh, that is currently in effect. And uh, I'd like to note uh, for the record that uh, we have maintained that ceiling, and we are presently uh, 24 committees under, as a matter of fact. In other words, uh, if you want a new committee somewhere in the executive branch you and you're near the ceiling, there'd have to be a trade-off of closing down another committee. Quite possibly. Quite possibly. Yeah. Uh, this is a process that is designed uh, to continually review the viability of existing groups. It, it is, in effect, forcing agencies to, to make choices. Uh, what the President was trying to do, I believe, was to terminate uh, committees that were marginal or committees that were duplicating effort between other committees or other agencies to try to see if we could save some money, save some resources, and focus our attention on groups that had a higher priority. Uh, the question would be who decides when these agencies, uh, when these advisory committees are unnecessary or duplicative? Is that the agency head in which the number of advisory committees exist? Is it GSA? Is it the White House? Where does responsibility mm -hmm. rest? The, the uh, responsibility rests with the agency head. Uh, the way this process works is um, agencies are given flexibility within their assigned ceilings to determine which committees stay and which committees go. We do provide agencies with input based upon their annual report submissions that we get each, each year mm -hmm. as to what we think uh, are the marginal committees, committees that perhaps are not as strong as some of the other ones. and we. Uh, give them advice on what we think. OMB will also give agencies advice, but it's the agency responsibility to really manage their advisory committee program and to live within those, those ceilings. Uh, I've served in the past on some of these advisory committees, and I must say they were excellent committees, the hard-working group of people, a group of experts you couldn't get without very high cost in the private sector that were giving days to government policy and uh, really taking days out of their particular career to do it, even though they were re re reimbursed for actual expenses, that kind of thing. Right. So uh, I've had a lot of faith in a lot of these advisory committees, but I'll tell you, one thing that sort of worries me is the uh, idea of these notational sort of run advisory committees where it seems the staff runs them, sends memoranda around which advisory committee members initial. And I would think the whole purpose of an advisory committee is to bring people that represent different views of a particular area of public policy together, let them share those views, let them build a consensus, let them sort out uh, what ought to be the policy thrusts, what are the priorities, so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I helped, uh, two of us wrote the law for the National Institute of Corrections, which is partly an advisory committee, but also an operating agency. The advisory committee actually has the authority to recommend the director to the attorney general. And uh, it, uh, we also built in six top federal officials with a series of categories of practitioners, uh, people that be interested in the field, so forth. So it was the only place in Washington where you had uh, those six different agency heads or subheads ever met together to talk about a common subject. Mm -hmm. And this was way before the drugs are bit. In fact, we helped suggest the drugs are bit. But uh, I think they're useful in that sense. But the idea of just sending around memoranda, not having them meet, not having a dialogue where people will change their views based on the expressions there and uh, learning something about the subject. So how many of those sort of notational advisory committees are still floating around? Mr. Chairman, I, I cannot answer your question because I don't have any firsthand knowledge okay. of those kinds of groups. However, I would like to say, while we don't do as much as we would like, we do try to get the staff out to attend meetings or to review minutes as much as we can. With so many mi meetings and minutes to, to, to acquire, of course, uh, it's impossible to get a real good, a real good uh, uh, sense of what's going on. 
Well, but one of the things that the minutes tell you, or attending a meeting will tell you, it will, it will give you a strong sense as to how the meeting is being run. Uh, we share your concerns that advisory committee meetings should not be rubber stamps. Right. They should not be. Should be a vigorous dialogue. Yes, You're not nor, getting your nor, money's nor, worth or lack of money's worth, as right. the case may be. Nor should there be meetings where the members are brought in and literally briefed to death and sent home yeah. groggy. Right. Uh, That's right. You know, it's Weary. A, yes, it should, it should be a, 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 given, a given change, a, a given take of, of discussion. Now, are you at GSA familiar with the administrative conference's final recommendations that, as I gather, included a pilot program allowing for more closed meetings? Are you, is that recommendation come across your purview? Or advisory committees? Uh, yeah, as I understand it. I am not aware of that, no. Okay. Uh, we, we, we had worked closely with ACUS, but I was not aware that they were applying that to advisory committees. Yeah. Mr. May, you were involved with the administrative conference. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I, I think that recommendation refers to the changes in the Sunshine Act, possibly. I see. Uh, and, and I am familiar with it. Yeah. And uh, how would that, to whom would that relate? Would it, uh, to which uh, instrumentalities or entities, would that relate to advisory committees? Uh, no, it would really relate to the agencies which are covered by the Sunshine Act. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that basically the, what the administrative conference concluded, um, and I referred to a committee that was put together to study this, and actually Mr. Kaminar, sitting to my left, what I referred to public interest members of that committee, and Mr. Kaminar was one, and also uh, another public interest representative was Alan Morrison of the Public Citizen Litigation Project, and, and these two gentlemen occupy probably fairly disparate ends of the political spectrum, but they, they both agreed the Sunshine Act really wasn't working that well. And, and so the recommendation was that, at least on a pilot project basis, the, the uh, Congress ought to uh, change the act so that the commissioners could meet in private if they detailed uh, a summary of their meeting and put it in the public record shortly after uh, the meeting uh, so that they could have collegial discussions. But, but another significant part of the recommendation was that in order to participate in this pilot program, the agency would have to agree not to use circulation or notation voting for uh, important substantive uh, actions because, as you know, the Sunshine Act uh, doesn't prohibit an agency from taking action by circulating written proposals at all. So it only applies to something that comes within the definition of a meeting. So when, when an agency votes on an item by circulation, of course the public has had no access to, the, uh, to that decision-making process. So the idea of the committee was that if we could reduce circulation voting so that the, the agencies agency members always vote at a public, open, regularly scheduled meeting so that the public can hear them announce and explain their actions. If, if we Well, let me, let me interrupt, uh, interrupt if I might. Do they really explain their actions? They don't explain the reasoning that led to it because that fight's occurred behind closed doors. Well, that, that, What's that's the plus that, in it? That, I, that, that's exactly right. I mean, the problem is they, what I should have said is that at the Sunshine Act meetings, uh, Mr. Chairman, they announce their, their position, really. Uh, uh, they usually don't explain much, but the one thing that, that most people agree doesn't happen is that they, they don't debate. Or there, there's not a back and forth or, or a deliberative process, and, and that's, that's really the problem. They, they come into a, a meeting, and, and uh, they'll announce that I'm going to vote for so-and-so, but, but you really don't have that de debate. It takes place now behind closed doors, and it takes place by virtue of the staff members of the uh, commissioners uh, meeting so that they can negotiate and report back to their, you know, to their uh, principals, to the commissioners. Or the commissioners can have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with another commissioner if they're more than three members. If it's only a three-member agency, then another commissioner, I mean, they, they can never talk to each other. If they're only, if they're only three members, it's impossible. Uh, so we think there really should be changes and that, that it, with these changes, if there were a pilot program, that, that we, the public could actually gain greater access by knowing what's happened during this deliberative process, letting the commissioners meet, and, and, and we could also reduce the circulation or notation voting to which the Sunshine Act doesn't even apply. 
Well, I'm curious to what type of agencies or what specific <coughs> agencies feel hurt by the existing law which says meet in the open unless you meet certain specified criteria, which permits you, let's say, on a land uh, purchase and uh, hiring of legal counsel, discussing legal cases, whatever. Uh, what agencies are seeking this? Uh, mo most of the agencies. We, you know, at, we, we had a public hearing at which in other words, everybody's a suspect in this. Yeah, it, that's the problem. In order to believe the Sunshine Act, you know, the problem is with the agency members. You have to really believe all of the agency members in Washington, and you know, I don't know exactly how many that includes, but a heck of a lot. You, you have to believe that they really, you know, that includes want to operate in bad faith and, and don't want to, you know, want to operate. By, uh, or just operate in bad faith. And I, I think that's not really realistic to think that they all want to operate that way. But what they almost universally say, uh, both in public, uh, we had a lot of public testimony, is that is you just can't have a real uh, deliberative process uh, that, that takes place in, in public. And so therefore, they, the Sunshine meetings uh, are meetings, again, in which uh, the commissioners come in and say, this is my position, but they're not really deliberating. And the inability for them to deliberate in private, the, this is really the key point, that the administrative conference found, and this has been found by other studies as well, that the inability to deliberate in, a, in, in private in a collegial way impacts the collegial relationships as the, of, of the agencies. And, and therefore, when Congress establishes a multi-member agency to get the benefit of a group of people working together, they, they, they don't really, they're not able to work together uh, in a collegial way. Uh, well, how do the GSA people and how do Mr. Kaminar, how do you all feel about it? I mean, is it possible for members of advisory committees, 30,000 of them, to sit down in public and hammer out an issue, even though some of them are on there because of their specific semi-extreme views, be they left or right? and come to a solution in terms of how you try to solve a particular agency problem. Have you heard and seen of these difficulties or? Well, we have on the advisory committees. Some of them are open and some of them are closed. Um, and um, I, there's a, maybe I'll, I'll yield to Mr. Dean on that. I'm not sure how applicable what we know about advisory committees would apply to a, a body like and I believe Mr. May is referring to bodies like the Federal Communications Commission, and they, they just may be different, and I don't... Well, that, that is, that's a different type of organ. That's a quasi-judicial, administrative, legislative, independent agency. And it isn't just any old advisory committee uh, where you'd have people change. Those people are nominated by the President of the United States, confirmed by the Senate of the United States. So I think they're far different in the categories I thought we were talking about that have 30,000 individuals spread over several hundred advisory committees. Mm -hmm. But I, if I understood, Mr. May, it apply, your comments apply to entities like the Federal Communications Commission. Okay. Are they, they only do. applied to, say, the Federal Trade Commission and yes. those? Federal Trade Commission, the Securities Exchange Commission, Federal Communications Commission, Commodities Futures Trading mm -hmm. Commission. It, it, it applies to the independent regulatory commission. Okay. So it, it was not thought to apply then to these advisory councils, no. advisory committees. No. But if I, if I can no. make comment I'm on this. I'm glad to have that Mr. clarified. Kaminar might as well. But I, I think the advisories, to my way of thinking, the, the advisory committees are in somewhat of a different situation in that they are constituted to focus on one subject. They're put together and there's a, there's a topic, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and they focus on that subject. And, and I think when they meet in public, they're, they're all, you know, concentrating on that one area. A problem with the, an agency like the FCC or whatever is that, that, I mean, just from an, a, a, an administrative efficiency point of view as well, they, they have multiple agendas. If, if you go to an FCC meeting, there may be 12, 10 or 12 items they're considering in a Sunshine meeting. And this happens every two weeks. And one problem with the w way the Sunshine Act works is for them to want 
And, and these, these items they're looking at, rulemakings and policies and whatever, they're coming around all the time. In order to have any discussion about any of those items as opposed to this one mm -hmm. topic mm -hmm. in, for a Federal Advisory Committee, they, would ha they have to have the advance public notice, the seven days notice, and again, these things are, are coming along on a continual basis, and it's just very difficult to do that from a, a, an efficiency point of view as well. It, I'd just like to comment uh, a little bit more on that. I think uh, where the uh, Federal Advisory Committee Act comes in in this whole process is that is that, that act is an essentially an amalgam between FOIA and the Sunshine Act, so that advisory committee meetings, uh, for the most part, must comply with the Sunshine Act in terms of when they open their meetings and when they can close them. Uh, in terms of the problem of whether they avoid meeting at all because for, of, of the constraints of either the Sunshine Act as incorporated into the Federal Advisory Committee Act, since many of these members are from disparate parts of the country and so forth, it doesn't seem to me that that is essentially a problem as it is when you have members of a commission that are on the same floor of an office that meet each other in the elevator and so forth. Are they, you know, starting yeah, a meeting have, or not, or should they right. talk to each other? So I think, I think that problem is not as much there, although, as I told you in my testimony, you had the Sensing Commission who has an advisory committee of people in the D.C. area that uh, uh, refused to to meet in the open, uh, saying, A, that this law doesn't apply to them, and it shouldn't apply to them, they said, because it would inhibit their robust give and take uh, of exchange and so forth of ideas. And I think they were basically exaggerating that concern, because I think preeminent here is the fact that these are open <coughs> government laws, that they're there for the public interest. The public is entitled to know what's going on. The report that the uh, uh, administrative conference came out, I thought it was a, uh, a reasonable uh, approach to try to have both those interests uh, uh, taken together to have some kind of a, a compromise measure there that would serve both of those interests as well. Um, I attended an advisory committee just last week of, of this EPA uh, Clean Air Act Advisory Council, and and the debate uh, was, I thought, fairly uh, robust. There were, were a couple people there who were clear enough wanting to object to where they thought the uh, uh, committee was going, but at the same time, there is that concern in terms of advisory committees are supposed to be essentially independent, and, and our concern is that in some cases advisory committees are beholden to their parent agency where they may hedge their views to that agency for fear of maybe not being nominated on the committee again if they don't get the right recommendation or what have you. We have to, of course, rely on the integrity of the members to do that. But one final point is that with respect to the executive order reducing the number of committees, I suspect that what may be happening in some of these cases is that on paper a committee may be abolished, but then it's moved under as a subcommittee of another advisory committee, so it's still yeah. there and there's a little shell they game going on. They are prolific as amoeba. Uh, before yielding to Ms. Maloney, just let's round this out. Staff is instructed to write the various federal commissions as to their reaction to that administrative conference proposal and we'll get their views in the record. So uh, at least they can't say they weren't heard. I'm sorry we didn't have some of them here. I didn't know it was limited strictly to them. Uh, the ranking member, Ms. Maloney of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. May, the, the conference hearing that you mentioned and the chairman mentioned last October, several uh, press groups raised a number of concerns about your committee's recommendations for changes in the Sunshine Act. Um, some of which were critical. Would you summarize the the concerns that they raised? Yes. Uh, the, I think I would characterize it this way. I think the press groups would say, and they, di they did say in their testimony before the, we had a public hearing of the Administrative Conference Committee, and, and uh, the, I th they said they agree that the Sunshine Act doesn't work very well presently because when you go to the meetings, that they are pretty much sterile affairs as I've characterized them. And so I think they would agree with that. And where they disagree is then what to do about it. And, and, and uh, their view is that public officials, uh, the, the agency members are public officials and they should debate in public and they shouldn't be afraid to debate in public and so forth. And that, that it's really the uh, commissioners that need to change, and we don't need to change the act. And I, I think the Administrative Conference Committee, which again had a, a widespread representation, just felt like that that realistically 
was not the answer and, and that there, there ought to be changes in the act. So, so I, I would say that their, their view is that the agency officials just need to, to change. Recently, when we passed a procurement reform on the federal level, immediately states and cities are sort of following our lead, calling, wanting copies, and indicating that they're going to change their procedures to meet the federal standard. Uh, many people fear that if we change the Sunshine level, Law on the, on the federal level, allowing more uh, private meetings or behind-the-scenes meetings, that immediately state and local governments would, would follow suit and change their laws to coincide with the federal uh, directive. Do you see that as a problem, or do you share that fear? Uh, I'm not really. I mean, I'm just I'm not an expert on how the states and localities would operate, but I, I don't think certainly they wouldn't they wouldn't have to follow the federal government. And, and I guess I would say more to the point. Many times they do, though. They they do they may I, I just don't know. But I would say actually that some of the state and federal laws which are are held up as sunshine laws and which are called sunshine laws, uh, they don't all operate in the same way that the federal law does in this sense that they they don't necessarily some do and, and others don't but they don't all prohibit some of the preliminary types of meetings that are prohibited under the federal law now they do require that when a city council has a meeting that it hold the meeting in public or, or that some state boards do but they they don't operate in the same way in terms of prohibiting all of the preliminary deliberations that that tend to, to be prohibited under the federal law um, Mr. Wagner and, and, and Mr. Dean, you, you mentioned earlier the uh, President's letter, uh, which was forwarded to Congress, uh, his proposal to eliminate 31 statutory advisory committees and the executive order to terminate one-third of, of advisory committees. And um, I'd like to ask you, um, since this directive has gone into effect, how many new agency advisory committees have been approved by OMB since the executive order? I don't have a precise figure, Congresswoman, on that. Uh, I, I brought the numbers of, of the committees that are currently exist they, in the aggregate. Well, do you have any information that you could show us a, a breakdown by agency of advisory committees and yes, the purpose of them? Yes, I do. I, I'd be happy to provide that to I, you. I would love a copy from my office. I'm possibly the chairman would too. Sure. Um, and uh, the across-the-board well, one-third. I might add, all of that will be put in the record without we objection. Will we will. The the across-the-board one-third cut in agency advisory committees must have, have caused a lot of um, dislocations, delays, and other complications. Has that been the case? Uh, what has been done to diminish uh, such possible effects? Was there was there a problem with this one-third requirement in diminishing? I initially, there was a, lo a lot of concern, particularly in the science agencies, as to how this process would work. For example, I know at HHS and NIH, which does a lot of grant review with its advisory committees, there, w there were some concerns about the disruption in terms of handling the caseload. For that reason, we worked with them and OMB uh, to work out a plan, if you will, that addressed that concern. And so they weren't forced to do it by the end of the fiscal year. We gave them an extension. And I believe that they have successfully met that challenge and that, that uh, there are no problems that I'm aware of in that area. Do you believe that Congress should place a, a termination date on all statutory advisory committees? Or? <coughs> the short answer to your question is yes. You do. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'd like to mention that the administration, including the vice president, of course, has asked Congress to do two things. One is to show restraint in creating new statutory committees in the first place. And the reason for that is, is that we'd like to be able to work with Congress to choose the tool that fits best in terms of meeting a public participation initiative or objective. And establishing a committee is not, not always the best thing to do. We'd like to see what the other options are. Second, the President has asked Congress to take a look at the inventories of existing statutory groups to see which of those could be terminated. Mm -hmm. Currently, there are, I believe, 421 committees directed by statute. And while I would certainly not recommend that all of them be terminated, because many of them do good work, it certainly provides a starting point to look at this. You think you should sunset them every five years? Or? 
Right. What would you do to The Federal control? Advisory Committee Act, of course, provides for a two-year sunset, two -year sunset. Uh, of, of the committees that are created by the executive branch. My suggestion, my common sense suggestion, is to impose a similar requirement for statutory committees and make them subject to congressional reauthorization. Of course, FACA does require Congress to perform oversight of committees, so it would be a logical nexus, if you will, to do that task at the same time. In your testimony, mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about the membership on committees, mm -hmm. and it jumped dramatically from 1988 to, um, I think it was 94, roughly uh, 20,000 membership to 30,000 membership. And why the dramatic increase in uh, membership on these committees when you've had all these directives to decrease the committees. Mm -hmm. And uh, That's even though you haven't increased the number of committees, the membership has grown tremendously. That's a logical question. How do you, how do yeah. you uh, account for that? First of all, the, the number of members uh, reported to the Congress are the number of members that serve at any time during the year. So it doesn't mean, for example, that today we have 30,000 members. The uh, second part of your question, uh, I would answer it that the committees that have been left, if you will, after the executive order terminations have had to work harder. And let me give you an example. Again, in HHS and NSF and some of the other grant-making agencies, mm -hmm. instead of using a typical advisory committee model where you set up an advisory committee to handle each discrete grant area, mm -hmm. they now have set up new models where they bring folks in or people in, experts in, as required. So I believe that uh, the answer to your question, at least in part, is that we're moving a lot more members through the system each year, and that tends to be inflating the numbers. With fewer hours per member. With fewer hours per member, and hopefully, hopefully less cost per member. So. Well, that, that makes sense. And, and lastly, we, we began this hearing with a Senator Lay. He was uh, testifying on his bill to um, really have a, a electronic FOIAs and to modernize the whole uh, for you. Um, law. Do you have any feelings on that or would any of you like to comment on the law that he's proposing? Or I, th I think that as far as advisory committee records go, I think it's a logical, uh, it's also a no-brainer to me. I, I think that some agencies are already making their records available uh, through the Internet and World Wide Web and other ways. Uh, at GSA, um, I work, I work for Mar with Marty Wagner. He's, the, of course, our new policy chief. We are we're designing or redesigning our home pages. And we plan, for example, to put up the annual report, our regulations, um, other materials that may be useful, such as training materials. So uh, we're on board. I think that uh, the, the experience around uh, with other agencies is, is perhaps a bit uneven. There is no you know, centralized effort underway that I'm aware of, but I think some agencies are trying to do it. We are moving as quickly as we can to put as much information as we can out on the World Wide mm -hmm. Web. It's a, a good way to communicate. Um, we also are trying to do it in a somewhat more systematic way. There's, there's been a problem. Basically, everybody is putting everything on the web, and it's all there. You just can't find it because it's sort of... <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're I trying know. to do it in a way that gives it more structure. Mm -hmm. So when you click on our home page, you see how it hangs mm -hmm. together. And, and there's a nice outline. And, and also, by the way, that doesn't require you to have very high speed lines because of all the pretty images that we send for you. But that is one of our big pushes. In fact, the administrator of GSA has, uh, is pushing all of GSA to have internet access by tomorrow, Flag Day. And he's also got a broader push to make as much of the information within GSA as accessible via the Internet to our constituencies, including the Congress, and we are working very hard to do that. So, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. I, I just would like to request that my opening statement be put in the record as read. I thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Condit couldn't make it. Uh, I just want to say that uh, Mr. Condit's done a splendid job over the years in developing some of the confidentiality standards uh, for medical records in particular, and the committee will be following that up. And I'm sorry he was not able at the last minute to join with us, but uh, he's an excellent legislator. Let me just thank those who, who have helped prepare the hearing on uh, both sides. Uh, starting on my left and your right with J. Russell George, the Staff Director and Chief Counsel for the Subcommittee on Government Management, Information and Technology, uh, Mark Ungerfer, the Professional Staff Member and Counsel, 
uh, Council Ned, professional staff member, Mark Brasher, professional staff member, and uh, Andrew Richardson, our clerk, Eon Davison, the staff assistant, and on the minority staff, uh, Mark Stevenson and David McMillan, both professional staff members. The official reporters have been Katie Stewart and Bob Cochran, and we thank you all. With that, this hearing is adjourned.